So how is everyone? Great. All right, I'm going to dig right in because we got a lot to cover. And so this is all about Cedar City. Um, we've been here since last Saturday. And so a week, you know, um, I want to go through what an assessment is. And since last Saturday, we have been secret shopping you. So almost an entire week, we have been here, sort of incognito, except for the few people I'm walking downtown holding a big monster camera. They go, excuse me, why are you taking a picture of my store? And so, and you'll see those pictures. And so that's what we've been doing. Maria, nobody gave us any information ahead of time. We didn't talk to anybody at the city, anybody at the county. We didn't talk to anybody. We just did it like any other visitor would do it. So she didn't say, oh, you should stay here, you should eat there, nothing. And we just wanted to be like anybody else. And we wore three hats doing this assessment. So this is not just about tourism. We looked at this, would we, what do we think of Cedar City as a place to live, raise a family, or retire? So we wore that hat. We also looked at it as a place to work, invest in, or could we bring a business here? Whether it's big, whether it would be a small business in your downtown. And then the third one, it's a place to visit more than a pit stop along 15. So those are the hats we wore. And just to give you an idea, Maria already did this. We have worked in more than 1,500 communities in 45 of the U.S. states, every province in Canada, Western Europe, Scandinavia, most recently in Africa. And we have done a lot in Utah. Back in 2010, we worked for, we did the Olympics. Um, I met Vicki Varela, your state tourism director, when I was sitting on the board of the U.S. Travel Office out of Washington, D.C., whose mission is to promote the United States. And Vicki at the time was a brand new tourism director, and we got to talking at a lunch, and she said, you know, I really want to help the rural communities of Utah, so I put together this thing called Ruralism, Rural Tourism. Would you come and help us? And I keynoted the conference, the, state, the Governor's Conference on Tourism in 2014 in Ogden, and then 2015 in Bryce Canyon, and I'll be there this year. It's in the Heber Valley. Um, and so we've done that. And she started off by having us work in Box Elder County. And by the way, you never promote counties. So no offense, county, but you know what? You know where Iron County is, but I tell you the people in Nevada don't, the people in Arizona don't, the people in Idaho don't. And by the way, has anybody in this room ever gone anywhere because it was a county? So in Box Elder County, we hung their hat on Bear River Refuge. And in Daga County, Flaming Gorge Country. And then in King County, Kanab in that area. And then Emory County, Goblin Valley, the Wedge Overlook. And then we, I spoke in Brigham City. And then we assessed Emory County earlier this year. Uh, we just got done doing Springdale and Zion National Park. By the way, we rated Springdale as the best town in Utah. Every merchant's open until 9, 10 o'clock at night. We're out there doing recreation during the day. We come back, almost every other town's closed at 6. Okay? Ogden, we did the whole branding and everything for Ogden City, uh, Heber Valley, Beaver County. We assessed them just north of you. Um, just about a month and a half ago, we just did the Logan uh, Valley area. And then uh, I, I was in Cedar City, what was that, two weeks ago? two weeks ago, and so I'm already back. And then we're doing this, and then uh, we also spent some time up in Brian Hidden Parowan. Uh, they're trying to figure out what's their brand. What is it they want to know, want to be known for? And you already have that. And we're going to talk about that. And so when we do the assessment, we look at all your marketing materials. We go online just like anybody else. We'll look at the state office. We look at your local. Can we find information? Is it good? Is it good enough to close the sale? Um, how do you stack up against everybody else? And by the way, everybody south of Provo is promoting that Mighty Five. And, and you're no different. And so... How do you stack up? It was a convenient to get information. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about marketing because at the end of the day, you're going to be judged by product development. Marketing will bring us to Cedar City once. It's the product that's going to bring us back. 
So we're going to talk about signage, gateways, wayfinding, overall appeal, critical mass. I'm going to explain that. Amenities, parking, restrooms, information, things to see and do, customer service, cross-selling. Matter of fact, we have a list of like 65 things, and I'm going to go through all 65 of them. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Kidding. So let's get started. So we got here Saturday and Sunday, and, and the first thing I wanted to let you know is that when I was here two weeks ago, by the way, I've driven through Cedar City a gazillion times. We're from, and let me give you a little more background. We are from Seattle originally, but we've lived in Arizona for the last few years. And so doing this area is an easy drive for us. I told the people in Brian Head, I don't know why you're not promoting, you're, you're promoting the Las Vegas over Phoenix. Phoenix is 10 times bigger than Las Vegas. And my brother and sister-in-law have been coming to Brian Head for the last 35 years and they live in Phoenix because it is the closest high elevation skiing to that major market, okay? But all the times I've driven through Cedar City, I always thought that was downtown. You know where that is? Walmart, Home Depot. I never had a clue, so I was speaking at the Rural Conference on, on campus two weeks ago. I stayed at the Spring Hill Suites, you know, right there on, on the east side of the freeway. And, and then I put in my navigation to figure out where uh, Southern Utah University was, and it had me go out of the hotel and turn right. I'm going, oh, the nav system doesn't have it. It's got to be over there with everything else. Because when you come down the freeway, that's what you see. And boy, was I surprised. And so, we, you know, I started going that way, and, and all of a sudden, I ran into a downtown. I had no clue. And by the way, most visitors, I don't know if they get much past about here because it's not exactly a great gateway into your downtown. You see the usual fast food, strip malls, older Mon Pa hotels, uh, auto repair yards. You have way too much chain link fence in this town. Um, and, and so um, those are those things. So this trip, we did stay at the Holiday Inn Express, Okay. Now, we love the B&Bs here. We did check them out. But because we're here a business, we don't have time to be the social experience. We have printers, scanners. I mean, we're working. And so we did stay there. I've stayed at Spring Hill Suites, stayed at other hotels here in the past. So I got to tell you, when coming from the south, and it's probably the same north, I want to give you our experience. First of all, as you're coming to the south from 15, yes, you see Cedar City next three exits. You drive along and you see South Main one mile, okay, which is fine. And then the next sign you see is this one, Cedar Breaks National Monument, Bryce Canyon National Park, exit 57. I said, perfect, okay. This sounds like the exit we want to take. Frontier Homestead State Park, exit 57. Now, when you take that exit and you turn right, there, it'll tell you there's nothing about a downtown other than the state park, every single sign tells you how to get through and out of Cedar City. <laughs> okay? And we have a representative from UDOT here, and I promised I'd be nice. Because I get how they feel. But I'm just telling you from a visitor standpoint. Now, and so there's nothing anywhere that says you have a downtown on the freeway. Nothing. Nothing that says Central Business District. Nothing. Now, if I go past that exit, keep going to the second exit, I do see Southern Utah University Shakespeare Center, exit 59. Okay, that's really great. But then I see this, 200 north, one half mile. Wouldn't it be great? Look at the sign. Okay, and say, I tell you what, we could even have Cedar City go make this for you. We'll just tack that right on the sign. Would that be all right? <laughs> but... You know, just doing something like that would tell people that there is something on the east side of the freeway, right? And because you keep going, we do see visitor information, and then we get up to the exit, and once again, all we need to do is just put one of those right there. And so, now here's the big deal. We take this exit, and we see a sign to Iron Mission State Park, which, by the way, we never found. We have no idea where that is, what it is, nothing. What is it? Well, you know what? Pick a name and stick with it. 
So, but I'm not done yet because we have the Heritage Center, the Heritage Theater, and Festival Place. Decide already. So here, this is the only sign we could find within 25 miles that have Iron Mission State Park. On the freeway, it says Frontier Homestead. When you get off the freeway, there's no signs to, there's, there is absolutely no signs to the, um, here, now all of a sudden we switch gears. Now it's Frontier Homestead State Park. All of a sudden, all the signage to the Shakespeare Festival, it told us to take this exit, disappeared. The only sign along this street, which I think is university, the only sign, and by the way, it says, I think there's something right there, um, is it, the only sign is the thing called the Centrum. And I guess all visitors ever coming in here are supposed to automatically know what the Centrum is. And so, you know, how do visitors find all this stuff? It doesn't matter whether they take the north exit, the south exit, or the one in the middle. How do you find any of this stuff? There is really no wayfinding to any of it. None. So the experience, and, and by the way, wayfinding, vehicular signs, information, restroom, there's no signs to tell you where public parking is anywhere in Cedar City. There's no signs that there is visitor information and so, attractions and activities, trail markers and access points, visitor information chaos, all this is part of a wayfinding system. And it needs to be your number one priority. And I know that, mean, is a state highway. I know that university or whatever, 100, I can't even remember. Is that university, yeah? 200 North. 200 North. I understand that that's a state highway. We get it. And so, but this is wayfinding. And, and by the way, I don't want this to be a gripe fest at UDOT. Sometimes cities need to take the lead and say, we, UDOT, can you be a partner? Would it be okay if we, the city, pay for, and we will do federal highway standards? I mean, we have a guy, that's all he does, wayfinding. And so, it, it, and they need to be decorative. It needs to fit your brand, the festival city. This is in Appleton, Wisconsin. They did that sign right there. That sign was about $850. It is mounted on an existing power pole in this case. Guess what? They put up 18 in their downtown, 18 of them, and their retail sales and services went up by more than 20%. So wayfinding plays an important role in your branding efforts. It, they should look festive. You're the festival city. Okay? They're a major component in your marketing efforts. They reinforce a positive experience because ours was very frustrating. Because your wayfinding is so non-existent, so to speak, and once again, do not go and go blame Utah. UDOT, I mean, there are federal, federal regulations. You can't put a sign more than 500 feet. I mean, it's, it's not easy even for them. It reinforces a positive experience because you know what? What we saw was the fast food side, the west side. Okay, Panda Express, I've eaten there too many times. And then, and then on this side, if you come up main, there is just no signage or anything that tells you to keep going because there's some good stuff ahead. And most of the stuff we found were we found because we were secret shopping you. I mean, we dug deep. Most visitors don't. And so it increases spending locally. It educates visitors and locals about what you have and where it's located. And it builds community pride. And it's as much a science as is an art. So this is absolutely not a public works project. Let me get that out of the way right now. And so it is a specialty. And look at this, between 14 and 28%, just wayfinding signs. And one thing that's really important is navigation systems are not a substitute for wayfinding. You know what we use navigation systems for? To type in things we know exist, we just need to figure out how to get there. Your wayfinding might tell us stuff that we had no clue exist, like your trail system or like the Veterans Memorial. See what I mean? We wouldn't just type that in. I wonder if they have veterans more. Let's type it in and see. Eh, we don't do that. You know, I mean, this is Logan is doing it. If Logan can do it, see, this is me pitting city against city. See? <laughs> mm. 
And they do a good job. And by the way, these in Logan, I, this one here isn't. In Logan, they have these on the state highway in the middle of their downtown. But the city took the lead. They worked with their district engineer and they made it work. And by the way, there's never more than five items on a sign. You can't do lists. There's, you know, one inch for every 30 feet of viewing distance. I mean, it is as much a science as it is an art. And so, you know, our first impressions were the University and Shakespeare Festival are incredible because we did find them, okay? And then the rest of Cedar City, north and south along Main Street, not so great. This is our first initial impression. And then, you know, west side, chain restaurants, Walmart, nothing great, okay? And there's no signage to a golf course, to a veterans park, Coal Creek walking trail, the library, uh, all the best of Cedar City, there's no signs to. And so people would never know them. So now, Saturday when we got here, our first stop, we did see the visitor center, and yes, there are signs to the visitor center. And, we, you know, as we're finding the visitor center, we say, oh, look at this, a downtown. And so we did stop there on Saturday, and it was awesome because right there, it's working 24-7, 365 days a year, which is, yes, I tell every city, make sure your visitor information is always working. And so we did go look at this, and we got all these different brochures and everything. So I'm going to talk about marketing just for a second. By the way, before we come here, brochures and printed materials are used 32% of the time because it's word of mouth, friends and family, it's the internet, Right? Once we arrive, brochures are number one, even over the internet. 81% of the time people use brochures. So once we're here, having these is very important. So we did grab this one. Um, you know, this one here, no offense to the paper, but you know what? 101 things to do in Iron County. Attend a government meeting. Really? <laughs> Read the local paper. Every single event is in there as a 101 things, and they're not in any kind of chronological order. So what happened is, when you start really stretching to get to 101, you just lost us. I would rather say, I'd rather see them say, here are the top 20 things you need to do in the Cedar City area. And say, here are our festivals and our events. You know, but when you start reading it, I mean, we laughed. Really? So, so locals are going to go to Walmart, local, you know what I mean? And it just, it didn't ring with us. So we set it aside, okay? And then we did use this one a lot, which is great. And we used this one, okay? Which is excellent. And I'll talk more about that. And there are two primary brochures we used. Now, when you go to this, um, there's Cedar City Festival City USA. And by the way, I want to give the city a bad time. See, this is what you call biting the hand that feeds you. But, <laughs> so, so when I talk about branding and stuff, I always say, you know, there's one phrase we want every single city to avoid using. And that is a great place to live, work, and play. Which 4,000 cities in the U.S. are using. So I open up the visitor's guide, and here's Cedar City's ad. <laughs> now, tourism does it right. They put Festival City. I mean, that is who you are. So anyway, just want to give you a bad time about that. But they do a good job. Brian had, I mean, this, this, by the way, I did tell this to Maria, and I have not said this anywhere else, and, and it is one of the best area guides, if not the best one in the state of Utah. So. I mean, it is well laid out. It's got the Utah Shakespeare Festival. It is easy to use. I mean, there's the arts, the southern, you know, the sumas in there. Um, I mean, it's got, you know, the university. And by the way, the opposite page, I'm only showing you one page, but at every one of these, she has the five must-dos, which is exactly what visitors want, details. 
Not just a list of everything. There's Brian Head Resort. Even including things like the elevation and how far away it is. More winter sports. I mean, it is just so easy to use and so well laid out. Dixie National Forest. Um, and and uh, here we go, Three Peaks. I mean, we started reading this and we started going, oh my gosh, Cedar City doesn't need to rely on the Mighty Five. We just got to get people on their way there to spend three or four days in Cedar City. Because this is amazing. Even your community trails, they're well identified. This is one, we're going to make a special trip back here just to do that. See what I mean? So by putting those things in there was really excellent. So it's a great job. You know, mountain biking trails, and we want to do some of those. And Cedar Breaks, of course, you'd want to promote. Um, scenic drives, I mean, you know, and we did those, and I'm going to talk about them. Um, now, this one here, I saw, here's the elevation. It's 19 miles. I went, okay, that's okay. Now, this one here, I'm putting a little further out there because I think, you know what? When you get more than 45 miles away, why would you go 80 miles and then turn around and come all the way back? See what I mean? So day trips are usually within 45 miles. Now, and so that's one thing. I thought, I'm not so sure, 70 miles to Zion. And by the way, everybody, everybody south of Provo is promoting these parks. And so, you know, if I'm going to Zion, I'm probably going to stay in Springdale. You know, if I'm going to stay in Bryce, maybe I'll stay there. So I think it's important to say, by the way, if you're coming into the area, and I'll show you, we even wrote a little text for you. So... Our suggestions would be, you have enough to offer to be a standalone destination. I just want to get that out of the way right now. You do. And day trip should be no longer than a 45-minute drive each way. There you go. And then, yeah, and everybody promotes outdoor recreation. And, you know, what you have that's different than every single other place in Utah, including Park City, is cultural depth. And I think that needs to be your overriding focus. So, so Jane worked, and by the way, my wife Jane, stand up Jane back there. She was with me this whole week. And, she, and by the way, you can't do an assessment without a woman in the car because they see so much more than us guys. <laughs> it's true. And so she wrote this. She says, the stage is set, time to feed your soul. Cedar City is Utah's number one destination for theater, art, and music set against a backdrop of spectacular landscapes and outstanding recreation play on. So that kind of messaging that focuses on the cultural attributes of what you have here and say, and by the way, recreation is second in our nature. See what I mean? Rather than say, we have recreation here and we have this and we have this and we have this. And so, and by the way, this is very, very tough for Maria to do because I can tell you right now, the people at Brian Head are not going to be happy about that, right? She represents the county. But you know what? We didn't say, we did say backdrop and spectator lines. And we, we think we want people to do both, but we want to put that culture up here because it sets you apart from everybody else. You are Festival City USA. Earn it and own it. And so, and it's tough for her at the county level because she represents Parowan and other cities and towns too. But for city, Cedar City, that's what you should do. This one here is close enough, no problem. You know, and maybe it's, maybe you, part of your marketing is we're a great jumping off point for the Mighty Five. See what I mean? So come here, spend a week with us. And, and one thing about Festival City USA is here is an annual calendar and the Shakespeare Festival. If you're Festival City USA, what about the other one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months? And by the way, if you're going to be the Festival City, they need to be festivals. You can't say, oh, well, we do an agriculture show. Oh, we're going to count that as a festival. Oh, we do a marathon. Oh, let's count that as a festival. Those are events. I think what you're doing is trying to stretch the word festival. And you know what? You're the festival city because of the Shakespeare Festival. Some of these you do, some of them you don't. We would love to see you start filling these in with festivals. So that you, if you're going to be the festival city USA, then own it. And make it more than 16 weeks. And by the way, almost all your other festivals are in the same 16 week period. You're not spreading them out at all to become a year-round destination. So, 
So if we come here in January, February, March, April, May, most of June, November, December, we're going to say, this is Festival City USA, where is it? Oh, we're counting a bike race as a festival. No, we're, it's culture. Your Festival City USA is built on culture, performing arts, visual arts, you know, music, those kinds of things. So I think, I'd love to see you do at Christmas a festival lights. And remember, festivals are a celebration, not just an event. I mean, you could do it's Taste of Southern Utah, Festival of Photography, anything that has art focus. I kind of pushed it on the Festival of Cars. I think, well, you know, they do pinstriping on motorcycles and stuff. Maybe that would count. You know, but I think that should be your focus. Okay? And so, there it is. It's, it's not an event. And by the way, all your festivals need to be worth a four-hour drive from Salt Lake City. Say, good, people are driving here for that. We can count it. But you know what? If you count the Kiwanis Pancake Feed as a festival and people won't drive 15 minutes to it, you can't count it. Make sense? So, you know, the focus should be on art, performing, visual, and culinary. And you got to work on the culinary one. We're going to talk about that. You know, sometimes, by the way, what you're going to see in this are suggestions. There are no recommendations because we never talk to you or anyone first. It'd be very presumptuous for, us, for me to come in here, Jane and I come in here, and tell you you should do this and this and this and this without ever even having a discussion with you. You may already be working on wayfinding. Who knows? You know, but these, so you're going to see suggestions. And by the way, sometimes I can say things you'd like to say, but can't without paying a political price. And I know that Vicki Varela, the state tourism director, is really glad that I'm the one doing it. So that, because some of you may complain to your legislators, you know what he just said about us in Cedar City, you know, and, and uh, it's hard for people in the political process to be as honest as I'm going to be with you. So, Saturday and Sunday, we started at Brian Head. I'm not going to go into detail because this morning is, is about Cedar City, but we did check it out. We did check out the ski area. As a matter of fact, when we went into Brian Head from Parowan, um, we went up and we saw a sign and we turned right and went all the way up the hill and we never found the ski resort because there's no signs that say, oh, the ski resort's up another half mile and it's on the other side of the street. And so when we're up on that hill, we did find it. Over there. <laughs> we did find the town hall, and we did find what was going, and we thought it was awesome because we worked in Beaver County, and they were talking about, uh, is it Eagle Point? They were talking about Eagle Point, the year-round destination. I went up there, and there were two maintenance guys there. That was it. <laughs> so we went up to Brian Head, and yeah, there was a bike race. There was archery. There were people going down these ramps. I mean, there were people renting uh, uh, ATVs or UHVs, whatever they are these days. Um, we did see the zip line, and we thought, uh, we saw the, the, the uh, fishing thing here, and you know what? We thought that this was a fantastic resort, probably the best in Utah for families and multi-generational travel. Just so you know, the biggest trend travels multi-generational. It's us baby boomers traveling with our kids and our grandkids. The baby boomers, us boomers, have a complex. We weren't there for our kids, but by gosh, we're going to be there for the grandkids. Right? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, yeah, okay, we're in that, yeah. And by the way, boomers, yeah, we're footing the bill. What's cool is in places like this, I mean, Jane and I were here, and we're going, my gosh, we should bring our kids in. We have three little grandkids. We should bring our daughter, son-in-law, and their three little kids and come here. We could spend a week here, and they could go fishing. We could go out on the trails. We could go down to Cedar City and see Mary Poppins, you know, which is playing this year. See what I mean? And, and do some of those things, because then they get their fix of cultural learning and recreation. And, and it turns out that is their market, is family. Because you know what? I would never say, hey, let's take the kids and grandkids to Park City. I just wouldn't. And so we thought it was awesome. Went in the vendors up there, thought it was great. Okay? Now, when we were up there, we found this. You can see I rode all over it. We found this up there. We tore, it was in their visitor center up there. And so we tore this off, and it's the best of Cedar City. And here's that list. There's 17 things on it. 
So we decided we were going to check out all 17 of these things, and we're going to check out what's in the guide. So we use these two pieces were our primary pieces. And this is nice because it tells you where they're located since there are no wayfinding signs. <laughs> While we were up there, we did go see Cedar, Bre Cedar Breaks. And it is fantastic. You know, one challenge we had is as you're coming from Brian Head, you're, you're like a mile away. It says, you're coming into Cedar Breaks, right? It says, welcome to Cedar Breaks National Monument. We kept driving and driving and driving. There's these look-off points that says, you can't park here unless you paid. There's no signs anywhere that tell you to pay. Where to go? None. So we'd pull off, park there, walk out to the overlook, and hope that nobody's going to give us a ticket because we can't find any signs that tell you where anything is. And so we finally kept going and going and going. And finally we thought, okay, we're heading to, we're heading to Parowan. I mean, you know, and then also, oh, there it is. And so these are the challenges. You've got to make it easier for visitors. So we did go there. We did pay our park fee. And it is fabulous. It's just cool. We also took a look at Parowan because they're in the county and they're trying to go through this. And so, I mean, we went to their downtown and saw the theater and the little cafe was busy. And, but Parowan kind of oversells itself a little bit. They talk about all of our cool shops and everything in our downtown. Well, there's like three, you know, that would cater to visitors. And some of them, you know, this isn't very helpful. And, and so... So, so, but we're going to work with them. We are going to work with Parowan because it's a great community. And then we also checked out the Parowan Gap, which I call the gallery. Now, you've got to understand, we've been all over the state. It's become our second home. And we've worked in all four corners, through the center. I mean, just you name it, we've worked here. And so, and we have seen hundreds of petroglyphs. We have never seen a concentration like you have at the Gap in one location. I would call it the gallery. And by the way, when you do your photography, always include people. Because when you do that, it tells you the scale of it. Whoa, this is not just something small. And when you do your photography, don't just take pictures of the petroglyphs, take pictures that back up so we could see the experience that shows their interpretive displays. This is very, very nicely done. Because if you just show us close-ups of the petroglyphs, why would we go there? So show us the experience in all your photography. Whenever you can, show a person there. So I picked on Jane a lot. Pick, uh, so that you see her looking at it, it brings it to scale. And, and, you know, photographs like this really bring the experience to life. The fact that you can get that close to them is really amazing. So we did all of that. Now, when we did this over the weekend, we did go um, all the way from 15 through Pair 1, all the way up here to Brian Head, and, or to Cedar Breaks, and through Brian Head. And then on Monday morning, I had to go speak to him at Brian Head. So you know what I did? Staying down here in Cedar City, I drove all this way and went all this way to Brian Head. So then on Sunday, yeah, we had to work this weekend. I went this way and I get, oh my gosh, I could have slept in another half hour. Now here's the challenge. If you're, I kept going, how do we help heroin? How do we help heroin? Well, if you're coming, if you're coming from the north, and you want to head to Cedar Breaks, we're going to absolutely go this way. But you know what? If you're coming from the south, I would go this way. And this way is a much prettier drive. It's prettier. It's easier. So what Parowan has to do is figure out what can we do to make it worth people going out of their way to go that way. Okay? And so, I mean, it is fabulous out there. Um, and so we did drive out. I mean, we tried every which way coming in and out of Cedar City. Up and down 15. The views are spectacular out there. All of your gateway signs in Cedar City are nicely done. Okay? So there's a compliment. Very nicely done. So that's what we did over the weekend. And then Monday we said, okay, let's dig into Cedar City. Now, a couple of things. When you're coming down the freeway and you see a billboard or a sign, and there's nothing wrong with this sign except... People have less than four seconds to read a sign. 
four seconds. There should never be more than like eight or fewer words. And so what you have is we have Cedar City, Festival City, USA, home of Southern Utah University. We already got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten words. And from the freeway, we could see Utah Shakespeare Festival. We never could read this from the freeway at all. And so if you're going to do this, I, I don't think I would even use these. And we're going, you know what? I, I think it's 75 out here. People are still going 85 or 90. Four seconds. And by the way, you're also competing with lots of billboards. So for any of you that use billboards, eight, 14 words. And so what happens is, I think doing Festival City USA, Utah Shakespeare, June through October, I think you have room for one message there. Because this one, we could never read until we're on the side road parked in front of the sign. Okay, so we decided to check out the west side. I don't know, what do you call that over there? The west side, <laughs> side. woohoo! So I'm gonna tell the west side story first. <laughs> we did find this over there as we're driving around, but we also found things like this that you see from 15. And when you see things like this, what it tells, you know what? People are gonna judge you by the cover whether it's fair or not. Your two covers are coming in on South Main and North Main and what you see on 15, which isn't that great. Um, and so I'd work with them, can we at least take these down? And then we say, no, we, we, if we take those down, they won't be grandfathered in. I mean, I could hear all the arguments, but you know, it's sending a poor message of Cedar City that we don't know. And so, and by the way, we did do shopping there. This is taken from Park Discovery. But as you're coming down, we did see the lighthouse, which we thought was amusing in the desert. Um, <clears throat> but, um, and, and so, we, I mean, we spent plenty of time here. It's got one of the most convoluted intersections in the United States, uh, which for, for about a minute and a half, you feel like you're in Great Britain. But it was interesting because a week ago I was in Grand Junction, Colorado, and they also have one of those. And by the way, it does make sense. It's kind of scary at first you're going on the left hand, but it does kind of make sense how you get people on and off of 15. So that's why I'm not, I don't have a suggestion. I wouldn't say to fix it, but it is kind of amusing to go through. The first time it's terrifying, you know. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know really. Is it really that much different than having a left turn lane and a light? And by the way, the two lights are not synchronized. I mean, it's like, okay, if we're going to the first one, why don't you synchronize the second one? Instead, you're going, ah, you know, and you're already confused, you know. Anyway, so we're driving around. We run into this, you know, and you, you do. The city does a great job at your gateway, at your locations, there's no signs telling you. By the way, even your wayfinding signs, once you get there, we tell you where it is. But if you're on Maine, good luck. And so we did see the ball fields there. It looks really great. We saw the aquatic center there. Remember, we're looking as a place to live, not just as a tourist. And so we thought it was fabulous. It looked really great. So we took these pictures, and then we're driving around, and we do see uh, the Park Discovery sign. We weren't too sure what this was. And by the way, Cedar City, could you get rid of the chain link fences in your downtowns? You know, I mean, you've got nice fencing here. You know, I would like to see you do that. Whenever we see chain link fencing, it kind of gives you an, it gives you a uh, uh, industrial, unsafe, jail kind of a look and so I mean you've got it and so I think that you should use that so we did park there we did go in and this is absolutely fabulous just an incredible great park and when we read this you know planned by 8,000 children in our community and everything was just absolutely excellent um, there were families there this is like a couple days before school started and so everybody was getting their fill but really, really a fantastic little park. One thing that'd be really nice is, do things ever take place here at this? Every once in a while? If there was regularly scheduled things, I'd put a little reader board that says, uh, the first Saturday in June, we do this here. We have a discovery thing. But we saw a little lamp, and there's no signs or no anything. And so we thought, well, maybe nothing's going on there. But if stuff is, invite us back. Just put a little reader board there. 
And then, to this day, I still cannot figure out what these are for. I did not know whether you pick up rocks and throw them at it because it has little dents all in it. What is this? You talk into one and you can hear it. The other. Oh, you can't. Okay. Gotcha. I didn't know that. See, we would have tried it. This one didn't have any sign explaining it. It's a cool park. It, it really is a cool park. It's just, I could not figure that out. I saw all the dents and everything. I thought, well, maybe people are using it. You throw things at it, and it goes clink, and it makes different sounds. You know? So, stupid me, I should have known. <clears throat> so, you know what? Had we not been just driving around the west side, we would have never been up this hill. We would not have known what you have as a city. All we would have known is, oh, there's a Home Depot, uh, you know, Applebee's or whatever over there, Walmart and all that stuff. Okay? But while we were up there, we decided to start driving around, and so we took the Covet Cedar City tour, which means we were picking out our next house, whether it was this one or this one, and, and, uh, or we'd love to have the views of this one, and then Jane kind of really liked the French chateau look of this one. And, and so, I mean, we were just going, holy smokes, wow, this is pretty amazing. I mean, they're beautiful homes and neighborhoods. And, and uh, just incredible. And then, of course, we saw the new temple being built, which looks fabulous. By the way, we were way over on the other side of North End of Town. We could see something up there that looked like a temple. And so we finally found it, but there's no signs of that either. And it's not open. When's it going to open? Next summer. Next summer. Okay. It's going to be beautiful. And so we're driving around, um, and we end up down the other side, um, and then we find this, Cross Hollow Arenas, um, Iron Rangers, not too sure what they do, but beautiful facility, uh, the arenas, outdoor, indoor. And while we're driving around, we just happen to see a road that says airport road. So we said, oh, they must have an airport. <laughs> I mean, if you do come in off the freeway, there's a little sign that says a picture of a plane and an arrow. But so, so we go down this road and in typical Cedar City fashion, we have beautiful buildings with no signage on them, so you have to guess. So we guess that this must be the airport, the term passenger terminal, and it's stunningly beautiful, by the way. And as we're driving past, we see hidden down behind some trees a little sign about this big. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I think that the, in Cedar City, uh, I think the goal is to confuse the heck out of our visitors. And so, but it's beautiful. We did see your industrial areas. This is the Coca-Cola bottling plant, the Budweiser plant. We saw Gin Pack. And then all of a sudden we said, wow, this place is really an industrious city. Now, putting on our economic development app, looking down there to your industrial areas. And I kept thinking, you know, Cedar City, aren't you pretty close in between Las Vegas, Salt Lake City? You're on Interstate 15. This makes sense. That you'd be a great distribution point. So we're wearing that hat. Now, we did all of this never find there's some lake or something up here and some kind of an ice rink somewhere. We could not find it anywhere. So we gave it one more shot. We drove back up on the hill and we're sitting there at the aquatic center and then we see a little teeny, teeny, teeny <laughs> sign right here, lake parking at boat ramp that you can read if you walk up to it. So, and by the way, we were parked right here taking a picture of the, of the aquatic center and didn't even notice these things. Because they're not wayfinding signs, they're like, you know, city parking signs. And then when we saw this, and you know what? You put this as a best of in this location. I'm going, yeah. remember, we're going down that list thinking this is the very, very best of Cedar City. And I just, I'm not so sure I would promote that right there in that location. It doesn't look that great. Maybe it looks better in the winter. And then we, of course, we did find the lake. Um, you know, lake maintenance vehicles, lake of the hills, welcome. And then here's all the list of rules. I'm sure that everybody sits there and reads all those for 10 minutes. And so, and it, but it is great. And this is the, like the day before school start, it was packed. Love the fact that you can rent stand-up paddle, I think these are stand-up paddle boards, right? 
I love the fact that you could do that and that you could rent kayaks. Really, really great. Our only question is, why don't you put some vegetation here so it's like a park? I mean, I kept, there should be street trees all along, or trees along here. I just thought, you know, it's, it's a gravel parking lot and a gravel beach, and I'm going, this could be stunning if there was just some vegetation. And it may be something that's in the plans, in the works. Remember, we're here as first-time visitors. We didn't talk to you first. And then we saw little kids trying to walk out to the cars in bare feet on this sharp, you know, crushed gravel. And so we thought, it's really great, but boy, it could be even better. So, so we found those, and we went, oh, I'm glad we finally found them. And then we're driving back down the hill, and we did find this little place out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how they make it. I don't know how anybody would even know this exists. It's a beautiful spot. We're driving around the corner. We all of a sudden, we run into a great little trail system. Of course, there's no information about what it's called, how long it is. Once again, we don't want to tell anybody about our things. And it could be that you as lawyers say, you're absolutely right. We don't want the visitor to know about any of this stuff. It's for us. <laughs> we heard it in Logan. So, you know, trail information. Here's access limitations, no motorized, dogs, trash. So we've got rules, but nothing that says welcome or any information about it. So our suggestion is give it a name. I think it already has one, but there's nothing there. A little gateway sign um, you know, just say welcome. Uh, this, it runs for a mile or a mile and a half or whatever. Um, did you know you could rent bikes downtown if you don't have one? Whatever. Or, or the great place for walking your dog. Um, it'd be great. Just identify it. And then all of a sudden we went, oh my gosh, here we are back here. See, we didn't know all this stuff even connected. As a matter of fact, if you want us to get from the airport to here, the only way we would know how to do it is to get back on the freeway. You know, now, and that may be, I don't know if there's other roads other than that go through the neighborhoods, but we never could quite figure that out. So, that was Monday morning, it's time for lunch. Now, when we asked our front hotel desk, where's a good place to have lunch? We asked the, uh, the lady working at the Visitor Information Center, where's a good place to have lunch? We asked probably 10 locals where to have lunch, and every single one said, you got to go eat the All-American Classic Diner. So we had lunch there, and we went, oh, my God. <laughs> this place really is a food desert. <laughs> and so, I mean, we even walked in there, and it was noisy, and I just, I was pretty shocked. So... You know, and I, my, um, our impression was, well, maybe the locals don't eat at the fine dining places. They just eat at the local hangouts like this, and they don't know to recommend your better restaurants. But here's what I want you to know. When we're asking the locals, friend, and by the way, I did the same thing at Spring Hill Suites two weeks ago, and they said the all-American classic diner. So I want to tell you about festival goers. 70% are female that buy the tickets. Average age is 44 years old, okay? By the way, 80% Caucasian, that's who attends festivals, like your Shakespeare Festival and others. And by the way, 78% have college degrees, and the average household income is $200,000 a year. And you're sending us to the All-American Classic Diner. See what I mean? Which one should we stay at? Yeah. So, but, but this is several of them, you know, and this is, you know. So, so we did go eat there. And you know what? The food wasn't bad, but it was the typical 1960s, you know, or mid-century kind of diner. Food was okay. Um, I guess they have a great breakfast. Um, and so we did that. So now we're on the east side, and we decided to explore. And we're just driving around because there's no signs to things. And so we do see, we found the Veterans Park, which is absolutely incredible. It's the nicest Veterans Park I think I've ever seen. Remember, we've been in all 50 states, worked in 45 of them, in you know, well over 1,000 communities. That is world class. Usually, I would never say a Veterans Park is a best of. In your case, we would. So... 
I want you to create a new brochure. And that brochure is the very best of Cedar City, Utah. So not that little placemat that I tore off, an actual brochure. And I'm going to show you one. This is Alpena, Michigan, which is a town of 10,000. And this is that brochure. We want you, look, at selecting Alpena's best restaurants. They even used a quote by me. That's fine. And what you do is we want you to promote your very best ofs. And what we're talking about is restaurants, retail shops, and activities. Okay? And by the way, and I'm going to show you more of this in a second. This is the ones they did in, in, uh, in Alpena, Michigan. And so, and by the way, the Besser Museum there, everybody was invited to be in here. I'm going to give you the criteria. They each paid $400. The Besser Museum was really struggling, but there was enough money from everybody else to cover half their cost for them. You need to promote your anchor tenants, the very best of Cedar City. And you cannot let politics get in the way. And by the way, this is a public-private partnership. So let me tell you about this little brochure. In Alpena, Michigan, they have 30,000 people live in the county, about like your population of Cedar City. What they did is everybody paid $400 for this. They were invited to be in there. Let me show you the criteria in a minute. And so they had about 10,000 households. You know what they did? They mailed this to every single household. Yes, actual mail. Not email, mail, snail mail. With a little card that said this. The number one activity of visitors... No, no, no. Yeah, the number one reason people travel is to visit friends and family. We hope you will hang on to this brochure so that when friends and family visit you, you will share with them the best of what Cedar City has to offer. Because we believe that every dining room table should be a concierge desk. Within days, people, locals would come down to these shops and they would go, oh my gosh, black sheep, I didn't know you were here. How long have you been here? And the merchant would go, 10 years. <laughs> right? And so, you know what happened is, all of a sudden people would get this brochure and they would go, oh my gosh, let's, let's, we should spend the night here. Look at all this stuff. This is cool stuff. This is how you get us past the all-American classic diner, by promoting your best stuff. Now, there were people saying, well, and by the way, a chamber of commerce could never do this. A city can't do this. Because somebody's going to call one of your city council and says, well, you know, I noticed they put together a brochure here, and I happen to own an all-American classic diner, and you, you did something. We think we're just as good as them. After all, we are number one on TripAdvisor. And then what happens is politics kills it. This is about the customer. You want them to have a good experience. By the way, there were people who said, well, you didn't pick me, and I think I'm just as good as them. You know what they're saying now? That was the best $400 I never spent because when we went to my neighbor's shop, they also went to my shop. We ate at Central. Guess what? We went in the gallery. We went to the French pie. We went in the gallery around the corner because of that best restaurant. And they're saying, yeah, we succeed with it. This is the number one most important brochure you could do in Cedar City. The very best of Cedar City. And by the way, you want, and anybody, here's the criteria, and anybody that says, I didn't get in here, said, if you raise the bar and follow this criteria, we're doing this every year because success breeds success. Okay? And so, one of the criteria was they needed to have good curb appeal. This is Alpena's criteria. Yours might be different. They must be open year-round. They need to be open at least until 7 p.m., and I'm going to get into that in a minute. <laughs> they must be open six days a week. They can be closed on Mondays. Now, in Utah, it might be Sundays, you know, and, and I don't want to get into the debate. Um, but whatever it is, it's a consistent day that we're closed. By the way, you don't know tell when you're here on Sunday... We did say, where's a, where's a good place to eat? We already did the All-American. And they said, well, there's nothing open on the east side, so eat on the west side. Because those are all chains and they're open on Sundays. Just so you know. And they were packed. Um, they need to be unique to the air. So we're not putting Subway in your best dub brochure. Or a chain. 
By the way, there's no hotels in here or B&Bs. The reason is we want them all to hand this to this. The number one asked question of visitors in the world is, where's a good place to eat? Please don't just hand me a chamber directory or a list. And then you can say, well, you know what? Under the counter, say, here is the very best of Cedar City. You know, and if you work your way through all the restaurants that are in here, let us know. We'll give you some others. And so, and by the way, we don't want to eat at chains when we're here. We can do that back at home. And so they need to be highly regarded by somebody other than themselves. <laughs> so 80% post positive peer reviews on TripAdvisor, written up in regional publications like AAA, TripAdvisor, Yelp, you name it. So we want you to market your top six restaurants, your top six shops, your top dozen activities. And don't let politics. It is the very most important thing. You know what? Take the politics out of it. We identified them for you. So here you go. Cedar Breaks, absolutely. Right there. Cedar Mountain Scenic Byway. Which, by the way, that's what I, that is the nickname for your Highway 14. I don't know why it is in Utah. We have to call it, it's the Highway 14 Scenic Byway. It's like, I wanted to call it the Grand Staircase Scenic Byway. You know, because it, I mean, it shows you that. But give it a name. Okay, Brian Head skiing, no question. And then, you know, Brian Head family activities. But I would, don't promote places, promote activities. So it might be the mountain biking or the ATV. Pick one that is so outstanding, it's the very best. And then Park Discovery, absolutely. And then Veterans Park. So there, I'm already doing this. Each one of these should have a panel. Okay. And by the way, when we were coming back, I said, I love this. You know, we live in Arizona, and I had never seen this whole thing that shows this. This kind of, I just thought this was the coolest graphic ever. And this is, of course, where we were. And, we, we, and Jane said, maybe we should call it the Marka Gunt uh, Scenic Byway. And I said, how did you say that again? And how do you spell it? And I would never, ever remember it. So pretty cool. So we're over there by the Veterans Park, and we see the creek right here, um, and, we, and then we see this trail. I have no idea what this is called. There's no signs or anything that say how long it is, where it goes, nothing. There's not even a map of it. It's just there. And once again, I think it is the Cedar City. It's ours and not yours. Stay off. <laughs> but... You know what? Cold Creek Trail is fantastic. When we come back, we want to ride a bike, walk it. I don't know how long it is or anything, but it looks fantastic. How, how long? Four miles. It's fantastic. There, we saw it in other places, but we didn't know whether it was the same trail because you don't sign your trails. You don't sign anything. And so, and of course, we did see, you know, the, the, the ballparks there. And then we went and we saw Canyon Park, which we didn't get a chance. Remember, we're working. And this right here, we thought was spectacular. Of all your parks, this one really stood out. And we said, this needs to be in Canyon Park. Did we choose wisely? I mean, it's fantastic. So, we finally went over, this is Monday afternoon, and we did find uh, where the, uh, uh, this is in the afternoon and uh, one of the shows was coming out, and festival parking. And so um, there's no sign to parking. We just figured the, the parking lot kitty corner is okay. I don't know if it's okay once school starts because you know how colleges are. There's no signs that tell you anywhere where there's public parking anywhere in the city. You just have to guess. And, and so we did walk across the street. By the way, we would have attended a place, but they were sold out. So good for you that they're sold out. Otherwise, we would have done it. By the way, we've worked in Nashville and Oregon. Their Shakespeare Festival runs six days a week, nine months of the year. And, um, and it is their big deal. But so we went over here. We went into the gift shop. And I did buy a shirt, but I said, man, I'd really like to buy. Do you have this? Do you have more in this back room? You know, I, everything that I was looking for, they had, were sold out of my size. And I, and I said, well, how come you guys don't carry bigger inventory? They said, oh, this will be gone in a week. School starts 
on Thursday or something. So we have to clear out of here. I went, what? The Shakespeare vessel does not deserve its own store? So hopefully you're putting one in somewhere. It should have its own store like they do in Ashland, Oregon. Um, so I was kind of shocked. And they said, well, we're going to move it over to the university bookstore. And I go, where's the university bookstore? And we never found that. Um, and so we just thought, wow, this deserves more. And so remember, these are all suggestions. And by the way, when you walk in here, there's no signs telling you where these theaters are. So you park, you go over there, and I'm going, uh, I guess this is the Beverly Taylor Sorensen Theater here because there's no other name on this building. And then you walk up to the door and it says, all tickets, including will call pickups, are now available at the ticket office near the Ains Studio Theater. Where the heck is that? And so as we're walking back there, we see these little tiny, tiny, tiny wayfinding signs that you can only read if you walk up to them. You can't see them from more than about eight feet away. So they need to be bigger so we can see where we're going. And remember, the average age of buying tickets is 44 years old. And what about us? You know, getting a little older, we need bigger letters. And so, but they were almost impossible to read. I mean, this is with a telephoto lens. So, yeah. Um, this is the old theater. I think it'd be cool. I understand that you don't really know what the fate of it is yet, somebody said. Um, at the, at the gift shop. And it said, well, you ought to put up a, uh, just an interpretive sign temporarily. It just said, this was the theater that was used from such and such a date to such and such a date. We can't wait for you to see the new theater, which I, might be the Randall Jones. I don't even know which one's which. Um, but I thought it'd be cool to do this. And there were people in there walking around, which I thought was cool. People were standing on stage reciting Shakespeare lines. I thought it was fun, just for, you know, nobody's vandalizing it. But I think it's a cool theater. And the new one's spectacular. So we did see this here. Unfortunately, I have no idea what the name of this theater is. I think it's a theater. And if you look behind the plan, it says Ran L J the, you know, but, but whatever the name of it is, is hidden behind the planners. <laughs> because Cedar City, we don't want to help you at all. <laughs> and so... You know, and so we did walk around. We saw, um, like this, um, there were a couple of mornings we saw crowds of people here, and there's a sign telling you what it is, but we have no idea what takes place here. I think they do like Q&A or introductions or something there. There should be even just a little portable sign like you see in retail stores that just said, every, every other morning this month, this is what takes place here. You can buy tickets, okay? And by the way, um, when we did talk to some people that were very, very upset that um, they were standing in 92 degree heat, there are interior ticket booths that were never open, so you have to stand outside, there's no shade umbrellas, nothing, you just stand out there on hot cement waiting in line to get tickets or ask information. I go, why don't they open up the interior ones where it's air conditioned? Why don't you put up some shade umbrellas? And maybe all this is in the works. We don't know. But, but we did hear people complaining about that. Um, and so kind of make it more of a pleasant experience for people. Um, you know, and by the way, is there anywhere here that you can buy food? No? So we have tables and chairs. What for? Just to make it look nice? And I thought, boy, you're losing out if you don't have concessionaires. We did see a concessionaire over by Green Show stage setting up. But I thought, man, you're losing out on some revenues here if you don't sell bottles of water or something. And so, but there's no information there. And so now we know where the Ains studio is. So, um, you know, we did find the Green Show stage. I also have one in Ashland that's very busy. And once again, there's nothing that says when the performances are. So unless you're carrying around the brochure, which by the way, you can only, you know, you have to go to the visitor center. Uh, there, there's no exterior brochure displays anywhere here at the Shakespeare grounds. And so, you know, be nice just to say invite us back. And the new theater is fabulous, just incredible. Is this its first season? 
Yeah, it's just incredible. Really, really nicely done. And so, so we had to guess. We, so we guessed that this whole thing is called the Beverly Taylor Sorensen Center for the Arts. That's not the name of theater. Did we guess right? Okay, see, we're having to guess because there's nothing that tells us otherwise. But on that theater, now what theater is that that the big sign is on? That's the Randall Jones one? Oh, see the sign's on the back side of it. But see the confusion? Okay, so then we said, okay, and it must include these three theaters. And by the way, I shortened the names just for this. Um, is, is that right? Okay, so I got that right. See, this is us working with other visitors trying to sort it out. And then it must also include um, the, the green show stage, right? And does include the Museum of Art. So that's all, okay. See, if you had a sign just that said that, you'd eliminate a lot of confusion for first-time visitors. Now, we met theater goers that have been coming here for years, and they got it down. But for us, it's first time. And by the way, and it comes to that best of list, the Nature Festival has to be number one, even over Cedar Breaks. I mean, it is your claim to fame. Um, and so we put it right there, front and center. And then we even saw this. We thought, now that's pretty cool that if you have kids, you've, they've got a place where we can take care of them while you enjoy a couple of the plays. That's right, right? Okay. And then we were looking everywhere for the Museum of Art. And we're standing right here and I still can't find it. Try to read that sign from three feet away. I know we're trying to keep it really modern. It's very much the, it's very much the minimalist. And I thought, I almost went down to the hardware store and was going to buy some black paint and just go in there and fill all these in for you. <laughs> but I wouldn't be here this morning because Jane probably would not be posting my bail. <laughs> so I refrained. But I thought, when you're in a car, you can't read this. And by the way, we were there Monday afternoon. We didn't know whether it was out of business, whether it was closed for the day, or whether it's not even been open yet. There's not one single shred of evidence that it is open, other than we saw some people walking out the door and went, woohoo, it must be open. <laughs> so if you have people constantly walking in and out, great. There's nothing. There's not a sign that says the hours. There's n absolutely not nothing. Now, I understand it's only been over like a month. And we, we just, I, I just think it's too incredible. Um, you know, I, I get all the concrete everywhere here. It's just a concrete jungle. And I get the minimalist thing. But I just thought, <laughs> make it look inviting. And so I'm probably getting myself in trouble with the architects and everybody else. Um, but, I, you know, we just couldn't tell anybody about it. But I got to tell you, it's one of the best museums in the country. Art museums. It is. Yeah. It really is fantastic. I mean, look what I put. It's worthy in New York City. Your town, your city is 30,000 people. That's world class. I mean, it is fabulous. We even love the fact that you can watch it back here, restoring, framing, doing all the work they do. If you go around the corner, there's digital labs. You can see through the windows. I mean, it was just incredible. And it was open until 7.30, yes! <laughs> but we had to ask, because there's nothing that told us otherwise. And it needs to be right up there. You know what was fun? is all of a sudden we saw, you know what? I think there's a general upscaling of Cedar City. We could see it, you know? We could actually see it that, you know, you had an agricultural base and everything, but you can just see the bar being raised with the new theater, Summa. I mean, you could just see it. And remember, we're here as first-time visitors, and we could feel that. We did go walk the campus, and it is a beautiful campus, by the way. We walked... We walked pretty much the whole thing. Um, obviously, we didn't walk down far enough because we still didn't know what a centrum was. <laughs> but we did, you know, we did see beautiful buildings, beautifully maintained. We saw all the picnic areas, not too sure what's happening there. 
um, but it's really great. Uh, we walked uh, SUU's Lombard Street, <laughs> which is really cool, by the way. <laughs> I mean, this is handicap accessible. I, I get it. But it was fun. We did that. We did, we did <laughs> right and go up the stairs. We took the long route just because it's beautiful gardens. So anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then there's these, we're walking around, finding these cool little hidden gems everywhere. And absolutely, Southern Utah, by the way, these aren't in any particular order other than you want these to be front and center. Um, you know, that campus stroll is great. It's a beautiful campus, and, and I think your students are lucky. Um, we did see this, but I don't know, does anything ever happen here? Oh, okay. It used to be the seminar place for the Shakespeare Festival. Oh, okay, now it's... Okay, but what you could do is say, uh, you just put a little sign there, just says, by the way, this is, we do outdoor classrooms here. That's another sales point for, for SUU. And so, and so, but just, just the, you know, just for let us know. And I thought if there's any public events there, you would let us know. You had lots of these little things, but there's no signs that ever say anything's going on there. And so then that night, locals told us to go eat at Rusty's. Okay? So these are all the best ofs we heard. And by the way, um, I, it was good. Um, you know, I ordered their most expensive steak and they had cut it all on the top to make sure it was cooked in the middle and everything. You'd go, is that really how you cook filet mignon? You know, so I was a little bit, I think it was good. But I got to tell you, Adrienne was our, our, uh, our weight person. Probably the best I've ever, I travel 250 days a year. She was probably the best server I've ever seen or had. And she probably, she grew up here, really proud of it. She goes, oh, yes, I'm a native. And, uh, you know, and, and, but she was just excellent. The service was really good. The food was good. I would consider it outstanding. But, you know, these are the top two restaurants that were told, we were told without us having to go use TripAdvisor. And then we got there right at dusk, and we just went, oh, my gosh. Once you get past the west side and get past Main Street, and you see the trail, you see the, the canyon out here, you see the stuff, you're just going, my gosh. Our opinion of Cedar City Monday afternoon changed 180 degrees. We started this test to say, what are we going to tell them? And we ended up saying, it's here. You just got to tell everybody else it exists. So that was Monday. So Tuesday, we went on that list and we started checking. Well, yep, we did boom, 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 boom. We still don't know where the Heritage Theater is, Cedar Ridge Golf, the, D, the uh, Daughters of the Utah Pioneers, Skateboard Park. So these are things we still had to go find, okay? And so we're driving around, and we finally had to use a navigation system so we could find this. And, and when we saw this part, we went, okay, now this one here looks pretty neglected, um, number one, it was hard to find. Number two, the paint and everything. And, and we did, we saw the ball fields here and just, yeah, it's, I guess it's okay. Um, and then we have no idea. The skate park, no offense, one of the weaker skate parks I've ever seen. You have this on your best of list. And, and, you know, in this location, I was really kind of surprised because most kids don't have driver's licenses. And it's kind of like out of the way. And, and I just went, and, and by the way, I'd like to know how many kids have read the city ordinance and everything, you know, <laughs> you know and the list of rules. And the, this weed here is about four feet tall. Um, so I, I was being nice when I said only three feet. Weed's grown through everywhere. So we just assumed that this here is pretty much neglected. That's our impression. And by the way, there's a trail right next to it. Is this part of that same trail? Would have never known. No signs, no anything. So we're driving around. We're desperately trying to find the golf course. There's no wayfinding signs. So we're driving around, and finally we see a business sign. That's not a wayfinding sign. There's no arrow. It just says Cedar Ridge. So Jane goes, oh, Cedar, I think that's the name of the golf course. There's no sign that says golf course with an arrow. So we did see that. We did drive up there. And, you know, and here's my question for you. Is this open for public play? 
Can you rent carts? Okay, I know you can't rent clubs because it says, there's a sign that says, you have to bring your own clubs. Okay? I'll show you that sign in a minute. Is there a restaurant there? Snack bar, snack bar. Okay, and is it 9 or 18? You can play 9, you can play front 9, back 9. Okay, both. So why in this sign you have a picture or a photograph? We're already here. We can see it. So put on here, open for public play. Put the information here so we know. Now, it could be that this is our golf course. Stay away. In that, in that case, no problem. So then you see that, but then you see the sign, and it says right here, must have own set of clubs. Okay, but what would you think? <laughs> and so, but we, we do say, Cedar Ridge Golf Course welcomes you Please obey all the course rules. All players must wear proper attire. No children. I mean, it's like you must have real discipline problems with your golfers. <laughs> I mean, we can't even get to the golf club and you're already hammering us with all the rules. You know what? I think that could be back on, the, on your scorecards. I think, you know, you know, I don't think you want to chase away before you've even gotten out of our cars. Did you try to make a tea time? No. Is it busy? No, they don't make tea time. Oh, they don't. That's actually a sales point, actually. It is. That you can walk in. That's cool. Um, and that's good. I think that's something you should promote. Um, we we would have. Remember, we're working. And so we did finally see this. I thought if this was a little closer to the clubhouse, it would have been great because then we could see the course layout. We can see that there's a front nine and a back nine. And, and by the way, you've got the course rules here anyway. Um, I mean, it, it looks great. Um, you have a reader board here. Apparently, nothing ever happens at the golf course, so you don't use that anymore. Um, but you should. You could just put, you know, uh, snacks, specials, uh, uh, if we have clothing, stuff, something, um, or just take it down. And so it's a stunning course, by the way. It's beautiful. Um, I mean, vistas like this, I just went, oh, my God, look at that. That's pretty cool. Now, it looks like a challenging course, is it? No, not too bad. Is there a par 72? 73. 73, Yeah. Okay, but anyway, beautiful course. But you know what? If we wouldn't have been digging, we would have never found it, okay? So while we were in the area, we did go over to the, what was it, the Iron Mission, whatever? <laughs> and we love the fact that they use uh, rod iron fencing. Uh, just take a note, city, uh, <clears throat> rod iron fencing versus chain link, okay? And we could find, this is the only state park we could find in town. So if there's an Iron Mission one, you know, obviously this is the Iron Mission, right? Go change that one sign. Um, and so, because ever, it just is, home, Frontier Home said there's nothing anywhere that says Iron Mission. And we did go through there. Um, you know, there's Jane in her new car. Love the fact that a lot of it's experiential. Um, I was going to give Jane bad time and say, oh, hey, that looks like the school bus you used to take. And then I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now I decided I'd be nice, and actually, I'm older than she is, so, you know. So, anyway, um, it's nice, that, and they even told you, by the way, we do have one stage coach. Don't climb on the other ones, but there is one that you can climb in and get your picture taken, which I thought was cool. It's a great museum. Overall, um, I think they could tell more of the stories, um, you know, rather than show pictures of what are already, when it showed you a picture of a plow, it had a drawing of the plow as it sits there. Never a picture of the plow, how it was used with a horse or an oxen tied to it. I thought, you ought to show how it was used, not what it looked. We can already see what it looks like. And so, you know, when, how much would it cost? You know, I'll never forget the first time I went to a museum, and I think it was in Cody, Wyoming or somewhere, where you talk about the handcart pioneers. And it's the only time that I was ever, and I know as a youth that, that we actually did some of those, but as a visitor, they actually had, in Cody, Wyoming, I think it was, or somewhere along the trail, is they actually had a hand cart that you could try to pick up and it was laden with stuff. And you try to pick it up. And think about how many thousands of miles or hundreds of miles these people walked. 
Matter of fact, they had there where you get in a covered wagon and it's wooden and then it actually, the covered wagon is hooked onto these springs and everything so that you're seeing what it was like and then you understand why they would rather walk with blistered feet than ride in a wagon. And I think this has some experience of things but not near enough. And so I would love to see an upgrade here. Um, first of all, the model train was broken. It looks like it's been broken for a long time. Uh, there was a set of looms in there and a chair where somebody might sit every once in a while, but there was no information about the looms, how they weave, nothing. Um, there was uh, lots of stuff everywhere, but really nothing that told you how it was used, how old it was. You know, you know what I mean? You, if, if we could just know what it was like to live, because it says step back in time, and you go there, it's just stuff. And so I think it could go a whole nother level up. And, and I get it, state parks and budgets <clears throat> and all the challenges. But I really like to see it take you back to the pioneer way of life. Okay? Once again, it's still, still great. So I'm just, you know, want to take a little side trip here, is great stories make the campfire memorable. I'll give you one little case history real quick, is that this is in Elko, Nevada, Northeastern Nevada Museum. I walked up in there and it was $6 admission, $6 for a local museum, I thought it was pretty steep. And then, and then when I bought the ticket, they said, by the way, hang on to your receipt because it's good for the entire day, you can come and go, I went, yeah, right. The average museum is 20 minutes in the United States, just so you know. And I'm going, yeah, right. Well, I walked in, and there was a wildlife exit wing, and then there's a historical wing. When I walked in the wildlife wing, they did not just show animals. They showed how a lion kills a wildebeest. And they tell you the story, and you're sitting there, as gruesome as it is, you're going, you're just glued to it. Next thing I know, I was there two hours, and I was still just going through the wildlife wing, which, by the way, is about the size of these two rooms. They told the story. Then they even told the story. Rather than just show you, here's branding irons. <clears throat> they tell you in the West, making a beef with a red hot iron is like placing a four-footed stake under lock and key. It shows legal ownership. Occasionally, a career in the cattle business was launched by illegally altering a brand, but the rustler's shenanigans usually were halted at the end of a swinging rope. They told the story of this rancher whose cattle were disappearing. It was down in a valley, pretty dusty in Nevada. It was fenced, yet the cattle were disappearing. They would go out there. There was no carcasses. It couldn't be wild animals. The gates and fences were fine. They were closed, yet the cattle were disappearing. They go down there in the dust. There's no human footprint, so nobody must be stealing them. Where are they going? So they finally had two ranch hens staked out the valley. They're in their sleeping bags, first night, second night, the third morning about dawn, just before dawn, they could hear a voice down there going, whoa, 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 somebody was down there. So they got out of their bags, grabbed their guns, and they went racing down the hill, and there they caught crazy Tex Hazelwood wearing these novel shoes so it wouldn't be obvious that he was stealing their cattle. You know what? If you can get visitors to stop, they will spend money. If you can get them to spend two hours spending doubles. I spent four and a half hours in that museum because the stories were so, they were stories. And so the average museum visit lasts between 20 and 40 minutes. There you go. And then tell stories. You know, you ever tried to pick up a railroad tie? Remember the people building? I mean, I told this up in Ogden. Yeah, I mean, a railroad tie weighs, I don't know how much. Can you imagine trying to pick one up? And I'm not suggesting people go do it because the you know, next thing you know, you got insurance claims. From, but, but you need to tell stories. And, you know, we don't care who donated stuff. And the state, <laughs> sorry, but as a visitor, you know. And by the way, when you market museums, avoid those works those words. So let me give you one more. I was working in Huntsville, Texas. Hart's Museum, a vet another veterans museum, 
helping every American remember through serving. So I walked in there, and went, oh boy, here we go, another veterans museum. But there was interesting, there was these 10 foot booths. And in front of every booth, or almost every booth, was a soldier telling his or her story. They were from England, Canada, the United States, Australia. And I walked up to one. I had just seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. Have you, have you seen that? They say the first 20 minutes of that movie is the best in cinema history. So I walked along, and I see this booth, and there's an old guy there, Michael Camella. He fought on Omaha Beach. And he was a little embarrassed. I said, tell me your story. He goes, I just saw the same prior. And he says, I can't see that movie. And he says, well, he joined the army with his neighbor and best friend. Here they are. They've known each other since they were three. They joined when they were 17. And he said, we stayed in the same regiment. They were on a landing craft standing side by side, pulling up to that beach. And he said, the Germans were just firing down us. He said, we were so scared, we wet our pants. Then they lowered down that ramp in the water, and instantly, my best buddy got shot through the hip. He says, I grabbed him, and we jumped down the water, and he said, the water's 42 degrees. He said, we weighed like 100 pounds. We're carrying 80 pounds of gear. We sank like rocks. He said, I was underwater. I could hear the bullets whizzing by me. And he said, he says, I just didn't know what to do. I got my best friend. He says, I just closed my eyes. <clears throat> I have a hard time telling the story. He said, I closed my eyes, and I said a prayer to God to please deliver me. He said, the next thing I remember, I was on the beach laying down my best friend who was shot through the head while he was underwater. I will never forget Michael Camello who died a couple of years ago. It's the power of the story. And it could be funny like the one you saw or, or sad like that one. But you know what? It brought it all home. And they had a guy who fought in Iwo Jima, Vietnam. I mean, there were different people there. It was incredible. So I want your museums to do that. And so while we're out, we did go over here to the Museum of Natural History. Um, and once again, in typical Cedar City fashion, good luck finding the entrance. <laughs> and so if you walk around the back and down here in this little teeny side door, we didn't know whether it was this. You go over here, out there. So we did walk in there, and that is the entrance. There's no signs or anything. And we did go in there, and it's a great little museum. I'm not so sure that this would be a fantastic best of in Cedar City, but if you're looking for some things to do, I think it's great. Um, I think they do a good job. And then, look, we saw on a sign, woohoo, Centrum. So we had to go, we got back in our car because we didn't know where it was, and then we found it. It's a basketball stadium, right? So now we found it. But we also found that right next door, and I thought that was so inspiring. I think that is cool. I haven't seen one of those before. I thought that was really cool. So then what we did is, now it's, this is still Tuesday morning. Uh, we go over here to the winery to check it out. And it opens at 11.30, okay? So we're there at about 10 minutes to 12. And, you know, it's the Stone Gate Inn. And so we, oh, we drove back there. And it says, oh, this is for B&B. &B, so we had to back out and then park out here. And then, um, and then we went there. And there was this couple and another couple. And it's noon. And it says open 11.30. Nobody's there. And so these two, th this is Jane, and then there's this couple right here, and then there was another couple. Well, they were over on the side trying to call everybody. One of them was in the B&B &B trying to figure out when the, when the winery opens or if anybody's going to show up that day. And the B&B &B says, hey, they just leased the space from us, even though they have the same name. Um, and, then, and then they were calling the phone number and just getting voice, everything. Finally, about noon, uh, about five afternoon, the guy shows up. And he says, I'm so sorry I'm late. I live way over by Bryce Canyon. I, it's an hour and a half drive. There's a lot of road construction. I'm going, well, if you're driving this every day, wouldn't you be aware of the road construction? I mean, he was a great guy, but you know, that's not a good way to start your experience. And remember who these people are that are attending these performances. And so he did go, and he was a great guy. He was very apologetic, but you know, he probably thought, eh, nobody's going to show up that early anyway. 
And it's cool that you have a winery in town, and absolutely, as long as he shows up, it should be on your best of list. So while we were there, we had lots of time to meet our new friends, Guy and Barbara, Rex, and by the way, Guy and Barbara are from Alta. He said, he said it's not Alta, that's you visitors, it's Alta. Okay? And then Rex and um, um, Amy right here, they're from Salt Lake City. Um, so they have been coming to the festival for the last six or seven years every year. And they have been coming for about 25 or 30 years. And Amy and Guy used to work together. That's how they, they connect. And they spent $1,600 on festival tickets, those four. Okay? Front row, right in center. I mean, and they're here for four days. Three, three nights, four days. And so, um, and, and I said, so where are you staying? They said, we're staying over to B&B, the big yellow house. I said, so why are you staying there? And they, well, number one, it's nice. Every, they have outdoor, you know, uh, outdoor balconies and stuff. Oh, and we bring our own food because this is a food wasteland. <laughs> but this year, they were trying restaurants and only cooking a few meals. So the B&B there would let them cook their own meals. And these are, um, and by the way, he just bought a new Rolls. So, the, you know, these are the demographic you're getting coming to Cedar City. They will spend more than anybody else. They'll, the, these four would probably spend the same amount as about a thousand mountain bikers. Really. And so I just keep that in mind, you know. And so, and they were impressed that they're starting to see an upscaling. You know what I mean? They were saying, so they thought this year, you know, they're going to try different things. So we asked them where we should eat, and we followed their advice, not the local advice. That's something you have to fix, okay? And so, and, and so we think that's really important. They said, go have lunch at Centro. We absolutely did, and we finally went, yes, great food. It was fantastic. Fantastic, just really great. I mean, beautifully designed, laid out, modern, and excellent, excellent food. And so absolutely, you're putting them on there. So now we've had lunch. That was like at 1 o'clock. And then we decided we better go check out downtown. So we did see the sign right here. We thought, boy, that should be on each end of your core downtown, not right in the middle. Okay? And, um, you know, and so, but we, that was nice that we saw it there. Um, but most of downtown, I mean, I mean, this is really great. You know, it's just add plants. I mean, add benches. Do so, You know what? That's a highway out there. If you want to get people to stop, you better get our attention, and that's not the way to do it. So, create invitations, not rejections. Extend window displays to exterior spaces. I mean, give you, these are out of Cedar City. Look, every merchant, every morning, this merchant goes and puts these out. It's a home accent store. She puts these out, and then at night, she puts them all away. It tells us you're in business and you're open. This is a florist. Every single morning, she comes out there and brings this little rack here, hangs the hanging baskets out there, brings this out. And I asked her, I said, does it really help your business? She goes, if I didn't do it, I'd look like this retailer who I hadn't even noticed. <laughs> I mean, your restaurant should be doing stuff like this. I mean, this is in little Canmore, Alberta, population 10,000. Every morning, these are window displays in exterior spaces, not folding tables or clothes racks. You know, look, you know how they do the bike shop here. You know, here's a table chair, you know, showing home accents. And by the way, all merchants should get about 30 inches to do this very thing. If there's a city ordinance that doesn't allow it, then change the ordinance. Okay? Now, well, <laughs> now, I'll give you some examples. Is this is totally fine. That is bad. You would never put a clothes rack in the window so you don't put it outside unless it's a garage sale weekend. It makes you look like a second-class garage sale town. So this is absolutely excellent. But you know what? That's bad. You wouldn't put that in the display window so you don't put it outside. 
you know, and then you got places like this, you know, that, that, that's, that's just bad. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, this is in downtown Logan. Come on, you guys. Logan can do it. I mean, you know, that's great. Look at this statistic. 70% of first-time sales come from curb appeal. Okay, just to put that in bigger, there you go, snap that picture. 70% of first-time sales come from curb appeal. You know what the number one thing that visitors say in the world? And I'll bet you you've said it. That looks like a nice place to eat. Right? Curb appeal. And most of your merchants don't. I mean, yikes. I mean, look at the paint. I mean, I, you know, it's just, I guess a little early on the decorations this year. Um, I mean, the sign is like 20 feet up. And I mean, even it's just, you're just going, woo. And, you know, and by the way, if any of these merchants ever come to the city and say, what are you doing for me lately? My response will be this right now is, no, what are you doing for yourself? You're spending a lot of money bringing visitors here, and the merchants aren't doing much to pull them in. This is a great shop, great sign, but you know what? There's no curb appeal whatsoever, nothing. I mean, why aren't businesses doing this? You could do what they did in, uh, in Fredericksburg, Texas, population 5,000. You know what they did? They got the merchants. They, one of the merchants went to, every, went to every merchant and said, by the way, do you have a downtown association in Cedar City? Yeah. You do? Okay. Is it part of Main Street? Part of Main Street, USA? It's kind of only the name anymore. Like they're not uh, okay, they're not active? Okay. Well, here's what they did here. In Fredericksburg, what they did is they had a merchant went down and just said, we want to go just line our facades with pots. Pots, planters, and benches. Donate some money. How much can you afford? Somebody gave them five bucks, 20 bucks. Somebody gave them 200 bucks, 100 bucks. They collected all the money. They went over to a wholesale nursery and said, at the end of the season, we'll take all the pots you have. If they, if they have a crack in, we'll take them as long as they're 21 inches or bigger. We don't want little ones. They don't need a match. Just, we'll take whatever you got. So then they went and got them at the end, of, in like October. They put them on a side street and they told all the merchants in that area, their main street, go grab them. They didn't say, you only paid five bucks, you only get one. They just said, go grab them. And so this merchant grabbed these, this merchant grabbed these, this merchant grabbed these down here. Uh, this merchant grabbed these two. This is in October, they just set them out. Then what they did is they brought in a load of topsoil, dumped it in the side street, and a load of rock and some landscape fabric. And they went to high school, Boy Scouts, uh, band, cheerleaders, any youth group that was looking to raise money. They said, youth, would you help us plant these? And so the youth went around, put a layer of gravel, put a layer of landscape, fill them full of, full of soil. This is like in October, November. No plants. And, um, and then what they did for the winter, they stuck pinwheels in them. And the whole street just came to life with pinwheels. And it was in the news. People were driving an hour just to go see all the pinwheels. Then in March, they had youth come back and plant them. And you know what? They never had one single case of vandalism because kids protect things they take ownership of. I mean, does that make you want to go in? They had pots left over, so they just filled them all up. Now, here's what we believe. City should be in charge with the curbside. Merchants should be charged with the facade side. Okay. That's before, after, retail sales went up 35%. Just doing that. And by the way, there's no reason why it can't work in the winter. You know, even utility boxes should be, should be covered like this. But you know what, look down there. I mean, this is okay, but you know, this is very weak. And by the way, you know what? Signs should always face the people in their cars or walking, not this way. And so our assumption is this theater's been out of business for a long time. Is that right? Is it still operate? No, no it doesn't. I mean, we noticed that these are not that old, you know, but we thought, well, somebody's doing these, but it looks like it's long gone. And I guess we are right. Okay. That's too bad. Um, and so, you know, and then 
Um, you know, like this here. Yeah, they're in, in business because we saw people walking out, but there's just no, no curb appeal. Um, I mean, so there you go. City, street side. Merchants, this side. Okay? That's the rule. By the way, benches should always be at the facade facing out. Never at the curb. I mean, do you really want to sit there at the curb and have a, a car to, a foot in front of your knees? So I would take you to take all these benches, put them against the facade back here, then have the merchant put a pot on each side of it. Okay? So, 70% of first-time sales comes from curb appeal. This is the 787 rule. Here's the middle one. Women account for 80% of all consumer spending. I mean, usually there's a guy in the audience that says, that's all. <laughs> but that's a fact. It really is. So take a look at this next picture. What do you see? <laughs> that was not, that, guys are going, been there, done that. That was not staged. Think, you know? I mean, I love this story. Look at, now, does that get your attention? By the way, this merchant was very smart. She put a little sign by the door that says, your husband called, he said, to buy anything you want. <laughs> I have two words for you. Think benches. You should have 30 or 40 benches in your downtown, all at the facade. Think about this. You see homes with front porches, and what do you see out there? Chairs, swings, rocking chairs, right? They may never sit in them, but it makes your home feel welcoming. It's the same with retail. I mean, I use Jane as a model there. That is what you need in your downtown. Excellent. You have one merchant downtown, oh, there's a couple, that really get it. I mean, that's fantastic. And then, I mean, I think, you know, this is very good. Just excellent job there. And by the way, for your merchants, get rid of all these closed signs. I mean, that wasn't here. But man, tell us when you'll be open. Make an invitation. When you say close, it says go away. If you say we will be open and then put your hours or whatever there, we can even give you blank ones if you want. You know, that's going to get my attention because the invitation to come back. And then create a lull, a, a pull, a, a, lure, a lure to pull people in the door. And so I love this one. So this is in eastern Washington, a little town called Omak. I took this picture, walked down the street. About 15 minutes later, I came back. Her door is right here. There was a line of people coming out the door and down the, down the side trying to get in. A line of people. I looked behind the line. There were two kids in these chairs eating ice cream cones. It turns out she has a little sign up here that says ice cream. Well, she, she sells home accents. So, so you know what I did, of course. I got in line. And so... I worked my way into the store, and there she is, has a little three-foot ice cream counter in the middle of her store. Now, most stores would put no food or drink allowed, right? Just ice cream. I walked up, just said, ma'am, is this your store? And she goes, you bet. I said, you know, if I was you, I'd give those kids free ice cream and let them sit out there all day. And she goes, well, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> then she clarified, and she goes, you know, I give kids one ice cream cone a day, and yes, they have to eat it in those chairs, and I have an unlimited supply of kids, and their moms love my store. I said, but when people are buying ice cream, are they spending money? She goes, yeah. I said, but what about mishaps? She goes, you know what? 70% of my sales come from people buying ice cream. 70% of my non-ice cream sales are people in there, and she goes, every once in a while I have a mishap, but the revenues far outweigh the accident. The other thing you need to do are blade signs. I'm going to show you these, and this is no lower than seven feet, no higher than, you know, and I'll show you. These are blade signs, okay? Signs that would be perpendicular to driving traffic and pedestrian traffic. When we drive down a street, this is our vision. Signs perpendicular to us. We're not in our car looking out our windows to see what you have above your awnings way up there on the facades. And, you know, there's Nantucket. 
you know, there it is from another. Notice they're, they don't have to be all cookie cutter, but they're consistent in size and height. This is Carmel, California. The best towns in America all have blade signs. This is Banff in Canada. I mean, this is Valparaiso, Indiana. This is Canmore, Alberta, population 10,000. Blade signs. This is Lethbridge, Alberta. These are built to 100 mile an hour wind load. They were just putting up, notice that one's blank. They were just putting these up. And all this is, these are actually welded in. And when a, if a business changes, they just change this. They were just putting them up. Can you tell me what's in any of those shops? Give me a reason to walk down there. There is none. I can't see anything. I have no idea what's down this street. How about here? Tell me what's in any of those shops. I guess if I go out here, and I'm not, and you do not take down your street trees, by the way. I've heard merch say, well, it's the street trees, and they agree my sign. No, because you don't have perpendicular signage. And so I don't know what's down there. You know what? What's down here? I can see something. Sewing, vacuum. It's the only sign. I could tell there's a barber here, which I thought was cool. You have two of those downtown. And, you know, I mean, What's in these, I mean, you know, look at this. I mean, and by the way, across the streets, no better. You know, I mean, this is a great store, but I wouldn't walk in there for a million years. But you know what I actually did? I did walk in there. And so I walked in there. It's a guy, Mr. Stapley. And it actually is a pretty cool store. He's got old sewing machines from like the 1930s. You know what he did? He took an old Singer machine, stripped it down, put in all the new scroll. I mean, this little machine, it's just beautiful. It's worth talking to him. So, it's funny. I said, Stapley, huh? He says, oh yeah, we're the ones who founded this area. We're the ones, and I've, there's lots of founders in Utah. And, and, and I said, you know what? You don't happen to have any relative in Bellevue, Washington, do you? And he goes, well, yeah, my uncle. I said, LDS? And he goes, yeah. Uh, Ron Stapley? He goes, yeah. And he said, oh, that was my bishop. <laughs> Here I am in Cedar City. And it's, you know, and so, anyway, it's a great little store that I would have never gone in based on their curb appeal. And so, but this store here got our attention Great signs, even though you can't really see it from the street. And um, I mean, here, nice sign, but beautiful window displays. I mean, these are among the best I've ever seen. They're just gorgeous. Enough that since we were walking downtown, we decided to go in. We went to the farm and loved it, the old mid, the, 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 it used to be retro, now it's mid-century cool, right? Which makes us that were born in the 50s feel better. And so, and really a great little hardware store. But what was, then we went in one, it said computers on the outside. We walk in the door and this doesn't look like computers. But we walked in and in the back there's a paint store and then there's a computer store. And then we saw that you could walk in each of these shops. They're all strung together. And you know, and so we were a little confused by this. But these shops all by themselves are worth a trip to Cedar City. Quit marketing historic downtown Market bullock drugs. <laughs> See what I mean? Because it is worth going in. I mean, they have the best collection of Halloween stuff I've ever seen. You know, and then you go over here, we've got a soda fountain. How cool is that? I mean, yeah, well, yes, we did eat there. And I mean, even that, I mean, all of a sudden we're just going, okay, you've got to promote that. You know, people don't care about historic downtowns. Give me a shop or two, I should go in. So now we got Central, now we got Bullock Drugs, right? I would probably put the sewing machine store in there. You could use a little more appeal. Remember, that was one of our criteria. But they, and I don't know if those shops, are all those shops owned by them? The, there's three of them. The paint shop is separate. Okay, but, but all those little home accent shops, they're all owned because all the workers are wearing, you know, headsets and stuff. And so we thought they were, but just excellently done. That is worth coming to Cedar City for. You know, and there's other stores that do really good. They don't have much curb appeal out here, but if you're walking down the street and can look in the windows, they do a great job. So 
For dinner, we took our friend's advice after they told us to go to Centro, and we ate here. Yes, two in a row. Great food. Really good food. Now, they do have this outside. and thought, man, it would be good if they had a little stage. You're the festival city. Get some music out there. It's the summer. Put a guitarist out there, something, you know, because it's a pretty space, but just not active. Great restaurant, good food, and absolutely they should be on there, Depot Grill. And by the way, we walked around the corner of the Best Western and went, man, this is one of the best, nicest Best Westerns I've ever seen. I mean, it's just gorgeous what they've done there. But you know, we were there, we looked across, we were looking across the street and we saw the, there's a park over there, but there's this building behind the park. And we went, I wonder what that is. And now it's getting dusk and everything. So we went over there. The park was fantastic. And that is how we found the library. There's no signs to it, but we found the library, which is beautiful. So then we've been going through that list. So now we're back there. Is that 100? Uh, that must be 100 East, right? Okay. By the way, one thing you need to do in Utah is communities need to put in their visitor guides, explain how the addresses work. You know, that everything that started in Salt Lake around Temple Square and everything's on a, kind of on a grid pattern. What confuses the heck out of us is when you give us an address like 1023 West 400 South. We go, now, <laughs> which is the West and which is, it's, you know what I mean? But if you say 100 West, 200 South, I mean, we could find anything. But visitors don't know that. And so that might be something just to think about, just you know, informing them, here's how a lot of the addressing works in Utah. So anyway, full of surprises. So we're driving, so we're on 100 East, I think. So we just said, well, let's head back to the hotel, but let's go down instead of going on Main, let's go to the back street. And what the heck is this? <laughs> oh my gosh, here's the heritage thing. We had no clue on the planet. By the way, our four friends that have been coming here for years said, yeah, we know they always have performance over there. We've never been able to find out, so we've never purchased tickets because we didn't have no clue what ours. And by the way, so we saw it says Heritage Center. So we're not too sure whether this is a theater or whether Heritage Center or something totally different. And typical Cedar City fashion, we like to give things multiple names just to confuse the heck out of you. And so it's Heritage Center. So we're going, well, do you, do you think that's the Heritage Theater's in the Heritage Center? Or do you think this is a different place? But there is a box office here, so this must be the theater. They just can't decide what to call it. And so that's how we ended our day. So Wednesday, the big missing ingredient is an upmarket hotel. You have mid-price hotels. You have lower-end hotels. You don't have any upmarket hotels. Um, and you could really use, it doesn't have to be a chain necessary, but one downtown, the closer to downtown, other than the Best Western, most of them, they tend to, you know, most of the newer, more modern ones are out on the highway. And you know what? We would always pick a downtown one if there was one quality enough. Um, this is the Ashland Springs Hotel in Ashland, Oregon. Population 22,000, Shakespeare Festival, of course. And um, that had... There was pigeons living in that until they really got the Shakespeare Festival going. And now it runs at 97% oxygen. The average room rate's about $400 a night. Sells out. People will pay for the quality if you give it to them. Okay? But we decided we better check out the B&Bs because they are very nice. You have a good collection of B&Bs. We just picked the top ones on TripAdvisor to drive by them. The only reason we stay in a hotel is because we need more room and we can't be part of the social experience we're working. And so, but we did see these and they were very nicely done, uh, nicely signed. There's the one our friends were staying in, loved all the balconies and everything, um, just terrific. Another little French chateau place. Um, they look great. So I'm glad you have that. So then we decided, this is the next morning now, we decided we better check this out. Now, we remember driving by this the night before. There's a big parking garage there. We have no idea whether it's public or private parking. There's no signs or anything. And typical Cedar, C Cedar City fashion, we don't want you to know. So we have no idea whether it's public or private. Okay? We don't know whether there's a charge or not. All we know is do not enter or overhead clearance. And so, and by the way, 
Is this public parking or private? Anybody know? It's public? Okay, but, but there's no signs. Okay, how about this one? Public or private? No signs. So every time we went somewhere like to Centro, I think Centro is... Okay, oh, it was on the other one. Every time we come to one, we'd park back there and go, oh, I don't see any signs. Uh, I guess we can park here. I mean, this is the experience you're giving people. And so, um, so we, we noticed there's a little walkway going from here. So we decided, okay, so we went around to this side trying to figure out where it says theater. And there's nothing. Um, what we saw was an almost dead strip mall. Let me tell you how you can fix it, okay? But that's what we see. No signs of any kind of theater or anything. However, we're driving over there where it says police parking, and all of a sudden we see a parking sign. The only way you see it's public parking is if you go into the strip mall and drive back behind some buildings. So why don't you get somebody to put them on the other side? And then we saw this festival hall. Now we go, now we're really confused. So... Is this Festival Hall, is that another theater? What the heck is Festival Hall? We're already trying to figure out the Heritage Center and the Heritage Theater. Have no clue what it is. But then we saw that it's a conference center. And I guess this room is Festival Hall? Is that what this is? The whole building's? Okay. Then the county and the city cooperated and made this a conference center. And the okay. Down here. So, so if you say Festival Hall, a conference center, see what I mean? <laughs> it would make it easier because we're confused. And so where's the Heritage Theater? Downstairs. So is the Heritage Center the theater? Okay. And we're still looking for a donor, so anyone with a million dollars, <laughs> Okay. I don't know what this state would do without the Eccles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from Ogden to Logan to Cedar City, man, what a family. And so, um, and so anyway, but you understand the confusion, okay? But then we saw little signs like this that say that there's meetings and stuff upstairs. Like uh, yeah, uh, the other day, there was an ATV meeting upstairs. It was in this room, I think. And so, so, you know, we did see this, but it's a little teeny eight and a half. I'm going, oh my gosh, they have this little plane. They have little teeny flyers on a couple of windows. This could be something cool. How would anybody know about this? They send them to the school kids. They send them to the school kids? Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Okay, I'm glad. And I, I thought that would be it. This is for the locals, visitors. Mind your own business, right? <laughs> but there's nothing here that says where it's at. So we thought, oh, now there must be another theater somewhere called the Cedar City Children's Musical Theater. See, there's nothing on here that says where it's at. Okay, so, and so anyway, we did walk through there and we did, and by the way, in the bus, there's not even upcoming performances anywhere here. You have a box office that doesn't say anything about what's happening. So these are the challenge. So identify what festival place is. What's the difference between the Heritage Center and Heritage Theater? So we did go back to our list, and now we've got everything. We did not go to the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers Museum because it's only open like a few days, only three hours a day. It says summer extended hours, not. So we never made it in there because it didn't fit in our schedule, okay? And so we passed on it. So we got through all of those. Um, what is that one up there? Oh, the Natural History Museum, which we did do that. Okay. So anyway, we did go to the Cedar Depot, the little thing, but it says it's only seasonal. It doesn't qualify. We want you to be a year-round destination. If you're, not, if you're only going to be open seasonal, great little shop, though, very much folk arty. Uh, once again, down here, this is the other side of the street. We have narrow sidewalks here, no blade signs, no beautification, no nothing, and we think they're almost all empty. At least they look empty. 
Um, this place here looks okay. And the other day I took a picture, said this is bad. So what they did the next day is they put another one out so we'd have two. <laughs> and so, and by the way, in the middle of downtown, we have more signs telling you how to leave than we do saying parking next right. And so, you know, um, so we had been to the uh, central right here. So, and we saw the sign, blade signs, we saw it. So we went there and this all by itself is a fantastic, one of the best, and I, we're art collectors, one of the best galleries we've seen. I mean, this is as good as anything in Park City or Jackson, Wyoming or anywhere else. It's an incredible, it's a nonprofit. Um, I mean, it's got, it's got pottery, photography, um, I mean, steel work, metal sculptures. It's got, it's just, it is really a great gallery. And Steve, I think it's Steve, was, he even said, if you ask me more questions, I'm going to talk your ear off. But he was a great, and talk about a great booster. And he even told us to go around the corner to the little artworks. So we went around and met her, and it's a great little gallery. Now, all of a sudden, we're seeing this upscale. Now we're seeing, you know, we call these, for people that are going to the Shakespeare Festival, they, cross-participation is good food and art. That's that audience. And so, and then, by the way, even Pastry Pub, we, we were eating at all the other restaurants. Um, everybody we talked to said it's fantastic. That it's really good. And so we took their word for it and added it on the list. But then there was one other thing. We heard that you had a farmer's market. <laughs> and they said it was at the corner of 100 East and whatever, you know. And so we went, no, 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 no. Why would you put a farmer's market there? No, 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 really sad. And so we didn't know what to do. We were trying to figure out what can we do downtown? What can we do downtown? There's got to be something we can do downtown. And I want to tell you a quick seven facts about downtowns. Here they are. The number one activity of visitors in the world is shopping, dining, and entertainment in a pedestrian-friendly setting. Number one. It's not why they come. It's the number one activity. You want to know why Park City is the number one ski resort? It has nothing to do with skiing. It has to do with Park City. And by the way, I'm not done yet. That's where 80% of the non-lodging spending takes place. You're not getting that 80%. You ever wonder why Disney put downtown Disney outside of each of its parks? Forget that down there. I stole the slide from another presentation. That's why they put it there. Downtown Disney, to get that 80%. That's number one. Number two, tourism is economic development. I get tired of economic development people telling me tourism is the worst form of economic development. Now, I will be the first to say it should not be your only form of economic development. But you know what? Anybody coming to Cedar City, a site selector, commercial real estate agent, a banker, an investor, they're coming here first as what? A visitor. Is this a place they'd want to live? Their families want to live? Their clients would want to work? Can they make money here? What are the schools like? It's the front door. And by the way, you know what they do? They come into your downtown, and the life of your downtown is the life of the community. And the life of your downtown is not very good right now. You have Bullock Drug, and then down the street, you've got, you know, Centro and the Art Gallery. I mean, you've got that little, that's about it. But this is why downtowns and tourism need to be joined at the hip. Fact number three, they're critical to your set. Success. The heart and soul of any community besides the people is its downtown. And by the way, if you don't hang out in your downtown, neither will visitors. And I can't tell you how many people along this part of southern Utah, when I say, where do you take your friends and family, they go St. George. That's not good. Now, in Beaver, they said we take them to Cedar City. So that's good news for you, bad news for them. <laughs> they do. So, bring down, you got to bring downtown and by the way, downtowns are back, and in a big way. Here's why. Because we are now in the age of third places. The first place is our home. It's where we live. The second place is where we work. And the third place is the place we go to hang out. You know what? 
Starbucks built an entire brand out of creating third places. So, we're changing. We want that place to hang out. And by the way, the future of downtowns is where we go after working on weekends. I mean, this is the future of downtowns. Okay? Visitors go where you go. And then, number six, in economic development, tourism and community development, there's absolutely positive, I stole that from FedEx, nothing that's more important than your downtown. And then, thinking that beautification, facade improvements will fix the downtown, it's what's in the buildings that makes you a draw. I can tell you've widened your sidewalks on that side of the street, you've added some street trees and everything, but you know what? Carnegie Hall, beautiful, stunningly beautiful. No matter how beautiful Carnegie Hall is, would you go there if there's nothing happening on the stage? Same with your downtown. It's what's in the buildings. So spending all this kind of money on beautification, this is one town that spent like $8 million on downtown, still dead as a doornail. So we're eating at perhaps the very best restaurant in Cedar City, the French Spot. <laughs> Michelin rated, Chef, I mean, this, I mean, now, people kept saying, you got to eat there, you got to eat there. Well, it looks like a coffee stand. You got, we ate there. And while we were, and it's fantastic. I love the fact that they, they got the space over in the building next to them. We got, they had like four people working in there. It's like, ah, I mean, it's like, and they, it is, I mean, I hope everybody here is eating there. It is fantastic. And um, just a great little spot. Nice people too. And we're trying to figure out, how do we do downtown? What do we do downtown? By the way, we added the French spot. Look at this. Is, this is an amazing best of list. We did a thing. And, and by the way, Maria, I'm going to give you access to our video library. And we did one called The 20 Ingredients on Amazing Downtown. Here's what we did. I came from the travel industry. I helped develop Whistler Resort in British Columbia, then Copper Mountain Resort, Colorado, Sun River Resort, Cent Central Oregon. For 10 years, worked in the resort, and then we've worked in all these cities since. And we worked in the travel industry, and what we found out, the number one activity is shopping, dining, and entertainment in the downtown. If locals are in town, near their visitors, we had to get in the downtown business. We do probably more downtown work than we do tourism work, because if you make downtown, you're going to get tourism. So you know what we did? Seven years. We looked at 2,000 downtowns and downtown districts in the United States and Canada. And there were towns as small as 300 and districts in big cities like Salt Lake or Houston or other places, districts. And we picked the 400 most successful downtowns, big and small. And we went to all of those and found the 20 most common ingredients that led to their success. And it doesn't mean that they all had all 20. But the best downtowns might have had 14 or 15 of them. We want you to watch those. It's a three-part series. We even broke it down. Here's what property owners need to be doing. Here's what merchants need to do. And here's what the city's responsibility is. Remember, two of them are private sector, building owners and merchants. The city can't regulate ours. And by the way, give me, let me give you another one. I think it's coming in here. 70% of all consumer spending takes place after 6 p.m., are you open? But here's the sad fact for cities in Utah. Not one single downtown of the 400 had more than two lanes in the middle of their downtown. Not one. Springdale. I mean, Park City. Ogden's 25th Street is a really cool downtown. <laughs> it used to be Duck down, kids, so you don't get shot. But now, I mean, stay, you know, even lifestyle retail centers are mimicking two-lane hydrants. And, you know, in this, I, I, I blame Brigham Young sometimes, just kiddingly, where, he, where, in, where in Salt Lake he said, well, you want to make sure our covered wagons can make a U-turn in the street. And, and, you know, but what happens is these big, huge, wide boulevards, I mean, it just doesn't work. So we're sitting there at lunch at the French spot going, what can we do? And we kept coming back to this spot. 
we thought, okay, we got an almost mall, almost dead, totally dead mall I, that obviously just failed. We've got this incredible theater right here. Um, we've got a parking garage right here that's way underutilized, at least the times we've been here. And then we've got a restaurant here. We've got another restaurant there. We've got another restaurant there. We've got another restaurant there. I mean, granted, they open up on different sides. Um, we've got the best shops right across the street and down the street. Um, we've got the sign right here, a perfect gate right in the middle of downtown. And I kept going. And, and you know, we, there's even access this way. What could we do in Cedar City to make downtown a draw. And there's even access back here, and they're working on Lynn's. You know, I don't know, is that still gonna be a Lynn's? Or, okay, I just, they're remodeling now, and I thought, there's gotta be something we could do. And so I kept looking at this parking lot, and you know, with these restaurants and stuff, I mean, everywhere, and I mean, it's way underutilized, and I thought, we got there's gotta be something. I thought, man, what if this was all a plaza? What if this became a reader board of events happening this week in Cedar City? You know what? These restaurants, there's just no, uh, not enough room here to put tables and chairs here. It slopes down steeper than most sidewalks. And it's, you know, with ADA access, they can't do much. But they could maybe on the back side. And then, of course, you got Bullock Drugs right over there. And by the way, this looks gorgeous when you're across the street and you can actually see the architecture. And so we kept going, you know, this poor restaurant here, they put out a little barbecue thing out here, but you know, it's on a parking lot. And so we kept going, what if, what if you created Cedar City's Festival Square? What if you created a plaza there? You know, I say people, the heart of a downtown, your plaza is the soul. So let me show you one case history. That's very relevant to you. This is Main Street Square in Rapid City, South Dakota. Population there is 70,000. By the way, your population within a 20-mile drive of, the sh of SUU is almost 50,000. And you've grown like 40% in the last 10 years. I mean, you're booming. And by the way, their nearest town is Billings, Montana, three and a half hours away. So they don't have a St. George. They don't have, you know, the neighboring communities that you have. And they want to increase tourism spending. So there's your demographic. But look at this. 22 million people a year passing right through city, Cedar City on I-15. 22 million travelers a year. And by the way, there's probably not a whole lot of commute traffic out of Cedar City. These people are working it, Right? It's not like in Salt Lake, oh, we live in Jordan and we, you know, commute. I mean, these are, you know, other than semis and stuff, this is, this is visitors. So, you know, I was working in Rapid City. I called them the hole in the middle of the donut. Because they're right on Interstate 90, similar numbers to you. And people go there, they get up in the morning and they head to Mount Rushmore. They head out to the Pinnacles. They head out to Custer State Park where Kevin Cosner filmed Dances with Wolves. They head to the historic downtown of Deadwood. They'll head to Sturgis, nine miles away, the biggest motorcycle rally in the world. They head to Badlands National Park or into the Black Hills. They will even go into Wyoming for Devil's Tower. Or they will go visit the little town of Keystone, which is the closest town to Mount Rushmore. A uh, hill city out there, this is during Sturgis, this is a hill city, is a great little arts town. So what happens is people stay there and they get up in the morning and they leave. This is a problem that'll, that is happening a lot in southern Utah where we're trying to promote the Mighty Five. So stay with us, get up in the morning and leave. And, and uh, you know, and then, but why would they come back? And so even this wasn't in downtown Rapid City. This isn't in downtown Rapid City. And you know what we told them? We went downtown Rapid City in the middle of summer, July, and we walked downtown and almost every single license plate was Rapid City. There were locals parked in front of their stores. And we walked down the side, it's middle of July, there's two people there, maybe somebody down there, this is a statue. And um, I mean, there, you know, there, there's a little girl there. I mean, it was just dead. And we're going, oh my gosh. And they're saying, but Roger, we have statues of presidents all over downtown. Well, the problem is, once you go and find your favorite president, get your picture today, well, you've been there, done it. 
So Cedar City, with all your statues and art, been there, done that. Why would I come back? That's what happened to them. I, you know, here's John that works with this, you know, <laughs> posing with one of them. And then this is where I told you that. There it is. Number one activity, just rubbing it in. And there's Disney again. And number two, if you don't hang out, they go where you go. And that's what was happening in Rapid City. And then, come here, we're spending money later in the evening. And there's that statistic. You know what? If we're, out, if, if we're out recreating, biking, hiking, fishing, walking, you name it, even at the plays. Now, you do have plays that start at 8. But if we're doing that, and when we're done, every place is closed, you're missing the 80%. So, a plaza can make you the after-work, after-school destination. So, they created Destination Rapid City. We found a lot right in the middle of downtown. It is this lot. It is 60 parking spaces. We told them, don't even bother marking up the parking. Just, I want you to turn that into a plaza. You don't need to make it up. Of course, the merchant screamed bloody more. You take away my parking. You're going to kill my business. By the way, if any merchant comes up to you and says that, say, are you telling me your business isn't worth walking the block for? Shut them up just like that. <laughs> really? So this is an old Sears building. I told him, tear down. This is one acre, by the way. And by the way, this is a parking structure. I want him to add third floor on it. And the reason why I'm on third floor is not to make up this. It's because we're going to put restrooms. We need to put a Zamboni in here, a chiller. We need to put visitor information. We're going to take the first floor of this back a ways and put retail in there. We told him, tear down the Sears building. I got a call from a guy. He said, Roger, my name is Ray Hillebrand. I own Prairie Edge in downtown, and I just want to let you know, I think your idea of putting a plaza here is great, but we're not taking down that Sears building because I just bought it. But I bought that Sears building. I'm going to fix it up. Right now, pigeons are living in it. But I also gave the city $2 million to build a plaza right next to my new building. So there it is, across the street. And we wanted that to go from that to that. Three-story, notice retail in the parking garage, no Sears building. You know, it was right here. You know, this was our idea, three-story waterfall you could project stuff on, uh, amphitheater right here. Well, that never happened because he bought the Sears building. And so this is it before. So looking at right there, and then there it is under construction. And there it is Sunday, July 8th at 10 a.m. after it was built. And guess what? It changed everything. I mean, that's, it's all full of restaurants in there. They've got little retail shops up there. I mean, they, they can actually close this off and put these out, and they can do beer gardens in there. Um, you know, I don't know if, can they do that here? Yeah. But, you know, it's something, you can do that. I'm just, I'm just being facetious. <laughs> By the way, the beer garden helps fund this thing. And so, um, you know, but... But they have restaurants. I mean, they put up these. They, I mean, I'm not done yet. Here it is. They put up a stage right here. There's the Sears building. I mean, all these little lights light up at night. Um, you know, they've got a little water feature back there. This is Sunday morning at 10 a.m. in the middle of July. And you know what? This morning, they have the police there doing their police dogs. They're showing people how they, how they work, how they arrest people, you know, and, and and then all of a sudden, car shows started coming, cool shows. Everybody wanted to do events in, in Rapid City. You know what? You're the festival city. Why should you have to do all the events? Why don't other, you have other people host their festivals in Cedar City by giving them a place? And so this is the splash pad. They shut it off while the dogs were doing this. They've got there. So you can see what they did here. They wish this was three or four times bigger. You know, there it is. And, you know, look at the kids playing in this. I went there. They, they had to do all the heavy lifting. But when they invited me back for lunch, I was supposed to meet them at a restaurant on Main Street Square. We were 15 minutes late because we had to park three or four blocks away. There was so much traffic and so many dang pedestrians. And they just smiled and said, we're so glad you had that problem. Really, that's a good problem to have. I'll show you. So I went there. 
And even though I didn't have to fund it, we just gave them the idea. I saw these little kids there. I started to cry. All of a sudden, the little restaurants, this used to be an old firehouse called Firehouse Brewing. It's doing business. Dan Sefner runs it. Main Street Square, Fun Squared. And, you know, so I went up on the parking garage and shot this little video. So there's the Sears building. There's the stage, right? You can see a band on the stage there. Here's the lawn area. And there, there it is with, with all the things going on. Um, all of a sudden, all the va- there was vacancies all over in here. There, haven't been, there have been no vacancies in Rapid City since six months before this even opened. And, um, I mean, Incredible. So there it is in the summer. And by the way, it's not big enough. There it is in the winter. Here's the deal. That splash pad and those activities in the summer last 120 days a year. This lasts 120 days a year. If you can get your locals downtown 240 days a year, guess what? Every single retail space will be full. Every one. They make $130,000 a year just renting ice skates. That is bigger than Rockefeller Center. That's 8,000 square feet. Rockefeller Center is about 7,700 square feet. $130,000 a year renting ice skates, and they have to dole them out because it gets too packed. At night, they do light shows, water shows, music shows. And you know what? I love the square. Someone who works downtown, I've seen the difference it has made. I see so many more locals coming down here to just hang out and have fun. And I come back downtown on evenings and weekends, which I never did before. I love seeing my friends, colleagues, and everyone from my cashier at the grocery store to my hairdresser to the mayor hanging around events at the square. It gives a sense of community that we only had at summer nights before. Summer nights is every Thursday night during the summer. By the way, you know how much that has grown? The average attendance on the Thursday night summer nights is... 12,000. Monday nights, they do movies on the square. Average attendance is 3,500. All these events are free. You have to run ice skates, but everything's free. It's for the locals. It doesn't matter your demographic, race, creed, religion. It doesn't matter. It's free. It's for the people. By the way, look what somebody wrote. I grew up in Rapid City. It was never as cool as it is now. Guess what? Within two years of that opening, the average age of a person buying a home dropped by 12 years. The youth and their families were coming back. Its peak hours are 4 to 10 at night. Christmas, they're selling hot chocolate on the square and there's Santa and Christmas music. And they light the trees and everything. Look at this. You know, businesses complained about it. So I said, make me a list of the 25 businesses who complained the most about Square, because they thought the Square was going to pull people out of their stores. I went into all 25 of them, and in 14 of them, I actually ran into the owner or a person who lived it, or a person who managed the store. And I said, I would go, what do you think of that Square over there? They didn't know who I was. What do you think of that Square over there? Do you think that really helps your business? I mean, I'm trying to get a negative response out of them, Right. Every single one that I was able to talk to said it's the best thing Rap City has ever done. There are no retail vacancies. The lower turnover, the retailers have almost zero turnover. Businesses now open later in the evening. They continue to break sales records. The average age is dropping, and it's now a great place for conferences, conventions, and trade shows. Because we do conferences and trade shows where the things to do at the end of the day. It is the central gathering place, a year-round activity center. It includes interactive water feature ice rink, program 250 days a year, stage, lighting, sound system, food, retail. We just designed this one in Caldwell. They are just now doing the final plans. I just want to show you this. Population 50,000 there. They took an old building out. City, city bought this building, tore it down, and they're going to take that space, and they have this little Indian creek, and we told them we want you to close off this street and make this whole thing a plaza. And then we'll open the backs of all these buildings onto the plaza. It will look like that. Now, this is about 9,000 square feet. It's got about a 5,000 square foot splash pad. By the way, you could shut off all of these fountains and they're all flush mounted. You could fill it full of chairs for concerts on the stage. You could fill it full of all tables and chairs and have the taste of Caldwell or the taste of Southern Utah. 
And you've got all kinds of vendor booth space all the way around it. And in the winter, this whole thing will be an ice rink. And by the way, the base of every single tree is a seating service. So can you imagine these kinds of activities happening in Cedar City during the spring, summer, and fall months? I mean, the health, the wellness. Can you imagine doing the taste of Southern Utah in Cedar City? You know, even in a place up near Edmonton, uh, which, by the way, we call the Ovation Plaza. You could even use this name. I mean, heck, you are the festival city. Ovation Plaza. They took this old place that used to be a, um, used to be a gas station, and it's going to turn into that. So if you can imagine a gathering place like this in the middle of downtown Cedar City, there'd be no vacancies. Your downtown would be an attraction and not a pass-through. So I thought, what if we made this a plaza? No parking, no cars. You'd be given up 110 parking spaces. You have more than that vacant in your parking garage. And you know what? You could fit a dozen restaurants around there, 20 vendors, but what if you did that? Got a stage right there, 20 by 50 feet. This here is 10,000 square feet. Okay, what if then, of course, we need to put public restrooms, some equipment so we can project things on a 30-foot screen back there. See what I mean? So here's your equipment, your sound, your lights and everything. And let's add some street trees on both sides of this, really beef it up. And then, you know what? Let's, uh, these are all outdoor umbrellas. So you could, this could be all cafe dining. You'd have all this cafe dining all around, wrapped around restaurants right on the square, just like Italy and everywhere else in the world where it's worked for centuries. What if we added more shade trees right there? What if we added more cafe dining there? Shade trees there. By the way, almost every single tree that's existing is still there. And then what if we put more cafe dining there? A couple more street trees there. Then we have room for vendor booths or food trucks or any kinds of activities. Maybe even more vendor booths there. And you know what? And then, you know, let's say we turn this, get rid of these parking, and we put a roundabout right here. So for delivery vehicles and stuff, and by the way, emergency vehicles can still get in here. And by the way, for stage productions, you can have stage access right there. What if, and so this became a roundabout down here so that you can drop people off, pick people up, handicapped access. This would be lawn areas around it. You know what? You could even take this little water feature that's been dead for looks like years right out there and turn it back into one because you'd also have cafe dining, some additional street trees right here. So what if you did that? You know what? Downtown Cedar City would be an attraction. Yes? Here? No, like next to the water. Yeah, there. So you'd oh. have a secondary stage there. Yeah, and I'm not too sure. I mean, this is just, you know, the, I would not consider this your final design. I'm doing this, you know, on the fly. Um, we actually do design. We did the one for Caldwell and a bunch of other ones. But I just wanted to show you what you could do to bring your downtown life. If you want younger people, they want other cars. You know what? Our daughter's 29 years old. She still doesn't have a driver's license. She's forced to live in urban areas because she doesn't want to drive. You know what? When I was 16, on my birthday, I had my driver's license. Millennials, you know what? Having a driver's license is not that big a deal. They want out of their cars the pedestrian experience. We have to get out of the cars first mentality because the millennial generation has taken us to the European standard. And by the way, there are more youth in the millennial generation than there are boomers. And by the way, you should cater the millennials because guess what? You'll still get us boomers. We like to hang out with you millennials whether you like it or not. <laughs> I'm pointing to them. We got some right here. They're the future. So would you guys hang out here? They're going, oh yeah. This is year round. How cool could that be? So... 
By the way, there's 34 trees in there. Oh, yeah, let's beef up your street trees there and across the street. And you know what? Why don't we put street trees right down there except for left-hand turn lanes? Am I in trouble with you, Dot, already? Well, you could. By the way, you, you know how you should do it in parking? By the way, you need parking on your wayfinding signs that you're going to do. You're not going to go to UDOT and complain. You're going to do it as a city and have, have Department of Transportation be your partner to help you do it right. Because they'll play with you. I feel bad for the people that work for UDOT because they feel like the IRS were always getting beat up because everybody wants their signs on the freeway and everything. Am I right? Just constant. So you say, look, we the city will take the lead and do this. We will do it with you. We will work with federal highway standards. We will foot the bill. And, you know, I think they'll be a good partner for you. So I don't want you to go back and start complaining about them because it's a state highway. And so, you know what? That would be downtown now. I mean, how awesome is that? And so... This is right back there. Even whoever owns this business could have their own little cool little plaza tucked away back there. And you know, all these trees are going to stay. And by the way, that little sad farmer's market, which we did go to, and thank goodness it wasn't in the parking lot, it's in the street, would have a home. So, when we go back to this list, and we go back to this and doing all of those things, and now all of a sudden you have a place to start hosting this. Yeah, you already do Groove Fest, and maybe, maybe the Festival of Flowers is up the hill and, and some of these things. But now, you know what? You just added another venue. And by the way, on that stage, you'd have street musicians. You'd have a university with a good music program. You'd have those musicians out there. You'd have food trucks out there. All of a sudden, you have a festive city 300-plus days a year because of the plaza. Now you will literally own your brand. Remember, you're saying Festival City USA for 16 weeks. You would own it. And so, entire United States. You know what? You want to go further? Sometime I'd like to see somebody do a Southern Utah public market, a permanent indoor year-round market that's open into the evening hours. Something like that. Uh, or like that. I mean, these places are incredible. And maybe there's some of these retail spaces right here that could, that could happen in right next to your plaza. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, and I mean, this is in Asheville, North Carolina. They took, an, they took a Woolworth store and every little 10 foot bus, all full of local artisans. You have the art, you have the culture here. Give them a place. That becomes an incubator for all those small businesses. So, when you get people here 250 days a year, every single merchant will come back and they will pay top dollar for the retail. That's why that guy bought that Sears building. He has the most valuable building in all of Rapid City. He charges almost twice as much per square foot and people are happy to pay it because they're so busy. Rapid City's Plaza is programmed 300 days a year. Remember, 120 days of ice, 120 days of water, and then 60 days of other stuff. Quilt shows, you name it. So you want another one? Here's where I really get in trouble. We'd love to see you with 20-foot sidewalks. We'd love to see you with four-foot landscape or between sidewalk and the street. We'd like to see one lane each direction. We'd like to see the center landscape meeting with left turn lanes or skip the left turn lanes. And so I got so bold as to say, what if you could close this down to narrow. You, you have roads and neighborhoods that are highway that are wider than Highway 14. <laughs> you do. It's all over Utah. I'm going, why don't you give the property owners another 30 feet out in front of their house and the city would have half the street to maintain. And by the way, in New York City, they're narrowing their lanes. I mean... This is, this is where Centro and everything is. I hope I got that right. I thought, man, if you could narrow this down. Well, what if you could narrow this down to two lanes right here? Now, I know, I, I can hear it now. And then even this. Here's the deal. Is in most states, we've worked with a lot of departments of transportation. They have two primary functions. Tell me if I'm wrong. Number one is public safety. Number two is moving traffic. 
in some states are adding another one called economic development. Now, we would be so, so let me give you a statistic right here. Right there. It's true. The slower we go, the more we notice what you have. And so, what if, now UDOP is probably not going to do that for you. They're probably not even going to support it because it's already pretty congested. There's going to be local people that scream bloody murder at me for even suggesting it. But you know what? They can go right up 17, I mean 15. They can go right up 15 to the north end. I mean, it's just, you know, piece of cake and they come in from that way. But, you know, we've even seen cities go to Department of Transportation said, we want you to deed back this half mile of street to us as a city, and we will do our own snow removal, we will maintain it, but it will be us as a city. Now, most times, Department of Transportation say, well, you're taking our highway and chopping out a section of it, right, which can be problematic. But you know what? You may say, Roger, I just don't know that we're going to go down here, but we're going to do the plaza, fine. As long as you do the plaza, you're going to win. Okay? I'm just planting the seed about the more intimate the downtown, the better the success. So you know that couple blocks where Centro is, right across the street, some of those are, are, could be really cool. If you could just narrow that street down, I know that's also another highway, I think, you know, but I thought, man, if we could just make it more intimate. But if you do that plaza, you will change everything. This is just food for thought. So our friends that we were the people from Salt Lake and Alta said, there's a third restaurant you got to eat at, which we drove by over and over and over and didn't even notice it. Chef Alfredo's. Fantastic. And so you know what? Pastry Pub, Chef Alfredo's, the Heritage Theater, Festival Square is all on that list. So what's next? Here's what's going to happen. I know some of you are taking pictures and taking a lot of notes. Now I'm going to tell you that we're going to give you this entire presentation. It is being filmed, so you will have it. And hopefully it will be on YouTube because you know what? We're preaching to the choir here. We need to preach to those merchants and property owners downtown. And by the way, the people that have properties there where the plaza would be, you say, you take away the parking, you kill my business. Not true. Not true at all. Think about this. Go to Walmart. You know, the average person that shops at Walmart parks 140 feet away from the front door. They have no problem walking 140 feet all the way in the store and all the way to the back to buy a Blu-ray or a DVD. They just walk two and a half blocks. The only thing with parking, it has to be worth it. You create that plaza, we'll walk three blocks. See what I mean? And you have lots of parking within two blocks. And so if you have brave leaders in your city, I would urge you to do that plaza. Your merchants will love you. Your residents will love you. Your visitors will love you. You will see your spending go through the roof. And you will be the place that we, if we go about to Bryce and all these other places, we'll come back to Cedar City because of your plaza. So, you know, these are all suggestions. And then we want you to make something happen. I mean, you can be one of Utah's most outstanding destinations outside of recreation. There's not very many. I mean, think about it. People know Park City, which is a little pretentious. Some, I mean, you know, we're working there, so I have to be careful. But, but it, it's just not the family atmosphere that you have and that Brian had is going for. Um, I, I, I just think, I don't see anybody in Utah promoting culture and art. Like, do you? I mean, yeah, Sundance, and you know, there are some nice galleries in Park City. I mean, Springdale has a better collection of art than you have. Their population is 700. But you have the urban amenities. And so, you know what? This has been really fun. To just to kind of, you could just feel this change in the air. And by the way, 
this doesn't mean we're dissing the people that are lower income. That's why you want to pause so that's free to all. So that income is not a, a barrier to them coming there and spending time. Matter of fact, on that plaza, we'd like to see some of those chains over time give way to local food. Wouldn't it be cool to have a Centro on the square? Wouldn't it be cool to have French Spot on the square? Wouldn't it be good if Alfredo's wasn't out at the airport, it's over on the square? Oh my gosh. You'd have people come to Salt Lake just for your dining. You remember what I said, performing arts, visual arts, culinary arts. You have the foundation of your culinary arts. I don't, there might have been a couple other restaurants we didn't eat at. Because yesterday, it, we spent all day putting this together. I mean, what you got here with the festival is fantastic. You got new theater, the new complex. You got amazing shows at the Green Show stage. I mean, you've got a great university. Wouldn't it be great if they had a downtown they could come and hang out in? I mean, you had 8,000 students. How often do you think they're in Bullock Drugs? They're in the garage. Yeah, well, yeah, I can see that. I mean, look what you have around you. It's like 20 minutes away. I mean, I haven't even seen the fall color. I went and grabbed that floor and went, oh my gosh, i got to see that. You know, when you start thinking about what you have here so close, I mean, look at that as a ski lift. So you know what? The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best plant time is today. These are suggestions. I hope you'll take some of them and just say, let's do it. Let's make that happen. And you can do it. And so the last one is, here's to make it to your city and its neighboring communities the mighty sixth destination in Utah. So thank you so much for coming out this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.